Hi. <laughs> hey, welcome. Uh, maybe we can start because uh, I kind of feel that I know everybody, but uh, that's not necessarily true that you know each other. <laughs> so it's always a wrong egocentric uh, feeling that just because you know someone, yeah, uh, everybody knows uh, everybody. Okay, so uh, why don't we introduce each other? Let's start with Brian. Um, so I'm I'm uh, I'm Brian. I am a high school teacher at a school in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, most rural, maybe some suburban. Um, and I'm also a graduate student at the University of Delaware, and Eugene is my advisor. Okay, thank you. And Abram, you are next on my... Hi, everyone. My name is Abram. I am... What am I? I am a graduate in philosophy and education, and I'm currently working on a graduate degree in philosophy at the new school. Um, really interested in philosophy with children and um, biological pedagogy. But I'm not working as a teacher at the moment, except for actually this background is uh, a kind of extracurricular school thing for, um, yeah, it's a school, online school thing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Welcome, Pernil, please. Uh, hello. Um, I've been working for 20 years at University of Copenhagen and uh, as an associate professor in development of psychology and education psychology. I resigned in November last year since there were nobody left to work with. And, um, and I'm working now presently as a uh, consultant in, um, in a municipality south of Copenhagen. With um, so I can sort of back to practice, uh, working with teachers and uh, preschool teachers and families and children. So it's a big step, but uh, I enjoy it very much. Great, thank you, uh, Anna. Please. Hi, I'm Anna Marianovic Shane, and I am an independent scholar here now in Philadelphia, not far away from where Eugene lives also. I am uh, interested in um, studying uh, democratic dialogic education and schooling. Um, also very much interested in a, uh, a, a various uh, uh, crea creative uh, uh, processes in development and in schooling. That's for me. Thank you, and Silviani, you just join us. We're just introducing you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Silviani, and I work at the University of Brazil in Brazil <laughs> in the psych developmental psychology department. Okay. Thanks a lot and welcome. Uh, okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Eugene Amatusov, and I'm um, a professor of education at the University of Delaware. My interests are in democratic dialogic education. And before we start, let me make an announcement again um, that uh, we are, this is a part of uh, open symposium. And what does it mean open symposium? Open symposium means that anyone um, can sign up for that and do whatever you want to do without any coordination with anybody else. And Anna, can you find please the form, uh, Google form uh, spreadsheet? So uh, I'll, I want to show you how to do that. And um, it can be in different format, like uh, we can start, like for example, this presentation will be uh, I mean, this meeting, format of this meeting, I will present something and then we will discuss. But it doesn't, it can be workshop, it can be just discussion from the beginning, just raising interesting issue and just discussing presentation of the incomplete research and asking for help. Uh, I just don't know, I, I want to, uh, or interviewing somebody, 
That can be another interesting format. Uh, whatever you want. The only thing you need to do is you need to fill out the form, uh, not the form, but uh, there is no form there, but it's a spreadsheet uh, with the, just you need to put what date you want to do that and uh, a link to the Zoom, uh, brief, uh, the title brief, very brief descriptions, and that's basically it. Um, where uh, yeah this is uh this is good uh, i can just, share it or you can share it with uh, well anna why don't you share that because that will be easier uh so uh, we are uh, so far we are meeting on uh this on tuesdays uh, like this time 11 o'clock in the eastern time i don't know what's your time right now uh, so you can see that, you see that's very, uh, we will add a new column. So there's uh, several columns there. Uh, date and you need the crossing out means it's already happened. So we right now, and, and you see, uh, we mark that with bold, uh, we, uh, which is the current uh, meeting. And then it will be, you know, uh, Christy, uh, you know, she uh, organizing a workshop. You see, it's very different format. And there is a link there, comments. And uh, another thing, we're adding recording and we will put li links to these recordings um, very soon. And then uh, next one is uh, August 16th is Dina. Dina just joined us. Hopefully we will see her. Uh, so it's a presentation plus discussion will be. And so anytime, whenever you plan something, you can just add and that will be it. Again, no coordination with anybody else, like what it's about. Uh, uh, and that will be, as soon as we'll see that, we will uh, create event on the Facebook uh, groups, several uh, Facebook groups. It can be two or maybe three, depending on the uh, topic. And that's it. Um, if you have any questions about, about that, uh, how to organize open symposium, uh, feel free to ask right now or later, whatever, whenever you want it. Okay. So again, no, you don't need to coordinate with anybody else. You don't need to ask, can I do this or can I? Yes, you can, unless you need any technical help. For that, feel free to contact us and um, we, we are happy to help you. Okay. So this is. Thank you, uh, Anna. I'll share, stop sharing that. Uh -huh, stop sharing. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so today uh, I want to share, I'm working on that paper. It's actually written and I have a uh, kind of good draft of that. Hi, Dina. Uh, and uh, so I want to share that and uh, discuss that. And thanks, thanks a lot for coming. So the paper is about uh, community versus society a normative uh, sociality for joint self-education. Sounds like a little bit, a lot of jargon, but I don't know how to change that and make it a little bit less uh, jargonistic. Um, if you have an idea, let me know. So let me provide a little bit uh, what the whole thing is about. Um, about 10 years ago, I wrote together with my colleagues, uh, back then they were graduate students of mine, we wrote a paper about community of learners and where we basically considering different approaches to this concept of community of learners and um, different typology, different types. We we'll look at the, what we called uh, back then instrumental community of learners in which the notion of community is serving for something else like could be for learning or could be for building relations, whatever. And ontological notion of communities. But what interesting is that uh, we discussed that, that uh, why people so much interested in community in education it's because they're usually, uh, it's an opposition to uh, conventional education where, and this is what I'm using jargon, when kind of educational sociality is like a life, peoples of life together, uh, more uh, viewed as an institution, uh, which is regulated by the rules and so on and so forth. At the top of that institution, 
uh, well, it's interesting to see how big this institution is. Uh, it could be Department of Education or Ministry of Education in the country. And you can down, down, down in this pyramid and you can get a classroom and classroom, uh, it could be teacher on the top. Uh, teacher, of course, subordinated to the school administration. So it's kind of hierarchy like that. And uh, it's more or less like a reign of the... Uh, <laughs> almost like uh, Sidorkin, actually, Alexander Sidorkin, who is a philosopher of education, he's my uh, compatriot living in the United States, he compared it with the feudal reign. Uh, so there is like a, a different levels of the feudals uh, like uh, that subordinated to each other. Uh, but uh, I don't know who is the Tsar of that uh, on the top, uh, but, or who is sovereign. Because in democratic societies, for example, it's difficult to find sovereign. It's kind of very messy feudal system, but it's a feudal system in his view. Um, so how, yes. does he, how does he differentiate that from just the bureaucratic hierarchy? Um, let's not go there, okay? okay. Uh, it's because it's become a different, it's an interesting topic, but it's not where I'm going to. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, and usually there is a lot of critique of that. And um, uh, so the notion of communities uh, was considered to be alternative. And in a way, back then, which is 10 years ago, at least for me in my life, it's not necessarily true for maybe all educators, this kind of two things were considered like either you doing institutional or this feudal kind of system or a community. And community is, uh, there is different approaches to the community. Well, it took me 10 years to realize that actually, uh, I'm not sure I like this notion of community. By the way, this article, actually rereading this article 10 years ago, uh, 10, for, after 10 years, uh, I probably read it in the middle, uh, but uh, I don't remember that. But now I look completely different eyes and I came to conclusion that at the end, we're destroying this notion of community. Uh, and in our own self-criticism, we kind of, at the end of the paper, we start raising issues with this, uh, but we didn't think that our criticism was, we didn't realize that we transcending the notion of community at the end of the paper. Uh, we thought we just need to find, there are some problems with the notion of community, but we thought we could find kind of, um, uh, some kind of solution, but within this notion. Like, for example, let me give, uh, actually, uh, it's interesting because <laughs> end of the paper, it was such a great beginning of my new kind of paper. <clears throat> so, for example, we realized that we had uh, a very biased kind of notion of the learning. And the alternative version of learning that we didn't like. On the other hand, if it's a community like, what kind of learning community it is? Like who will, uh, who is in charge of defining who is, what's the learning is? And we thought that's kind of a problem with this notion of community because our notion of community was very organic that things emerge, but it's emerged, but we already have an opinion <laughs> where it should emerge to. <laughs> there is kind of the problem with this. Also, we had problem with this uh, although it's community, but we claim that it should be, because in our kind of good version of this community of learners, it should be multicultural community. But also we said that mm, community is very clear connected to the notion of culture. And multicultural, there is, it's, there is something, there is tension there. And uh, again, we couldn't just uh, resolve that tension, uh, but I'm really like our honesty of uh, listing problems with this. Uh, there's more problems I noticed uh, now than back then, but I'm, I'm so happy to start where we were honestly reporting problems, uh, which we couldn't resolve. So now, uh, uh, what's happened in the 10 years, uh, which is important because uh, for me, with me, it's I started participating intensively with uh, democratic education. So before that, I was more involved in dialogic education. And even from dialogic point, I had problems. Again, we uh, we put this notion, we put the 
problems there in the article. But again, we thought it's possible to resolve within the community. Dialogue itself didn't nicely fit uh, notion of community. I'll tell you why. Because notion of community, there is uh, so much focus on unity, community, unity, uh, and collaboration. And the notion of dialogue, especially the notion of Bakhtinian notion of dialogue, didn't fit nicely with the notion of collaboration and unity and agreement that uh, many communities that, uh, of learners were seeking as kind of proxy for truth, for example. So we, again, it's listed in the paper at the end, but uh, we thought we could find the solution to that. So anyway, uh, this working with democratic um, uh, Education uh, led me to actually to intensify these tensions. And especially, especially when uh, I get together with the founder of the uh, democratic school in uh, Pennsylvania, Jim Ritmudo, and he uh, constantly emphasized very strange thing, which has attracted my attention. And I initially I couldn't understand why I'm so attracted to that. And I love that, but I couldn't, for a long time, I couldn't articulate why. He defined his school as a scaled down society. And the that was on society, uh, by the way, I talked with him and he said, oh, it's, just, uh, it's just like we want society and scale down. And uh, he himself, uh, at least he's claiming that, uh, didn't pay much attention that his change, suddenly this notion of society appeared. But for me, it was very helpful because the more and more I was thinking about that, the more I started realizing that this notion of society can be a very alternative to the notion of community and that struggle that I had. What's the next thing that helped me, really helped me, is reading a lot of anthropological uh, studies and books, uh, especially by uh, David Graber, who is an anthropologist, but also a very interesting philosopher and uh, a political, uh, like, poli what, activist, I would say, and also thinker, political thinker. So he's so many things, unfortunately, he very recently died of COVID and uh, very young. And, uh, uh, and fortunately, uh, they finished together with his colleague uh, a grandiose book, uh, which I highly recommend. The dawn, is it called The Dawn of Humanity? Abraham the Lutheran. Dawn of Everything. Or The Dawn of Everything. It's not a Dawn of Humanity. The Dawn of recommend. the History uh, of Humanity. Yeah. Which is he, even more was helpful for me. But that time I was very ready to understand this whole thing. So uh, by then that I realized that many things, like for example, uh, notions of like civilization, uh, being polite, all of them, all these notions uh, that we have as coming from the notion of city, and they have a root of the city in different languages, like polite coming from the polis, uh, Greek polis. So it's a Greek and uh, civilization from the city. Uh, that's more Latin thing. Uh, and, uh, but the, again, the notion of the city emerged. And what is city? It's very interesting. We're learning more and more about what the city is. And the city was a kind of organizational, organization, um, like, Topological organization of different tribes that come together and start living together. Some of them are living together temporarily. Uh, it could be seasonal. And by the way, it's happened in many different places. It didn't kind of emerge in one place. And it was emerging, it looked like, uh, in different places. And um, and the city implies that there will be no community there, one community there. But there is many communities there, many cultures, and they have to live together. By the way, the even uh, special organization of the city, uh, the original uh, planning of the city, based on the, that that uh, places for the where the tribes where their sovereign sovereignty were there, and with their own organization. So with the city, there was no idea that there will be one value that prevalent in the city, but the multiple values, multicultural, and this uh, the whole notion of uh, pluralism, 
political pluralism and many other things emerge in the city, as well as uh, acceptance of the foreigners, not as adaptation, like tribes can also adapt as somebody uh, like a foreigner, but in this case, you, be, you have to become a member of the tribe. When in the city, actually, what's interesting about city, you can stay there as a foreigner. You don't need to join any of the tribes. And that presence of the foreigners as a foreigner will never, with, um, uh, as a particular people who don't belong to anything within the city, nevertheless protected by the city, was very interesting and uh, very, uh, very important. Let me start now. Uh, yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, also, that, yes, yes. Uh, it, uh, I'm just reading Abram's uh, comments about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and Anna, can you reply, please? To the, oh, oops. Do we have Anna? No, we don't have Anna. Anna this um, so that's, I become very much attracted because I think in education, it become a very, very important things. So I was still thinking, and this is what uh, my paper was about, about normative ideas. So if you look at that society and community, they do not, uh, it's not necessarily they opposing each other, but with the idea that's what's normative in education. And I, I won't consider in education, not any education, but specifically since I'm interested in democratic education, which is I define as a self-education. It's not, in my view, self-directed education. Self-directed education is only part of self-education. Uh, and uh, if you want, I can elaborate on that uh, because self-education is much bigger things. Um, let me just give one exa example. It's very particular self-education, very, uh, I would say, uh, very uh, produ uh, 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 paradoxical uh, self-education when uh, students demand me to be their kind of... Uh, to patronize their education. It's what I call uh, auto -pat uh, paternalism, which is, sounds bizarre, but it can happen. So the students wants me to force to, them to study what they want to study. And in my view, this is a very interesting, very paradoxical form of self-education, but it's absolutely not self-directed because they want me to direct them to the goal that they have that, by the way, conditional, Conditional things, they might change their mind at any time or change the uh, direction. They say, okay, stop directing me in that direction. Now I want to be directed in that another direction. So in my view, this is not self-directed education, but it's self-education. And what I'm interested in is uh, when that self-education uh, is collective, people come together and they join together and they want to study together. And in this case, uh, this is why I start realizing that notion of uh, society as normative option is much more useful as notion of community. By the way, it took me time to figure out that and, and experiencing tensions within this uh, self-directed, uh, not self-education, self kind of joint self-education uh, things. Um, so this is what a kind of my uh, paper was uh, is about. So I'm not denying the notion of community. It's very important. But uh, you know, the society, of course, uh, what's interesting about society, it involves many, uh, it involves a plurality of communities, diversity of the communities, as well as people who might not belong to any community. It's kind of strangers, foreigners, uh, which is, can be also incorporated in the notion of the society. Uh, who is that foreigners if you translate them in education of the, um, in the educational terms? It's autodidacts, people who want to study by themselves, but they uh, temporarily, whatever, they align with this joint self-education uh, for whatever reason. They might attend sometimes, uh, they might ask for resources, for help, and so on and so forth. So they don't want to be a part, uh, they don't, they are not interested in any decision making together with somebody else. They don't want to form any community there, but they want to be around uh, and because they want, uh, like any city provides, synergy. 
uh, and some kind of support for that, but without any joining any particular community and any um, uh, any group in that in that sense, any collectivity in that sense. Uh, so they kind of uh, uh, they kind of around, but not necessarily completely in. Again, foreigners, you know, typical foreigners, what <laughs> than strangers. Uh, and of course, it can be dynamic because people can be in and out and, uh, and so on and so forth. And I think that notion of society exactly kind of captures that. So uh, what kind of important things that society brings? First of all, it brings definitely pluralism and it's cultural pluralism, pluralism of values, pluralism of cultures, pluralism of views, pluralism of commitments. Pluralism of ideologies and so on and so forth. All of this pluralism of way of being. Uh, that's definitely city, uh, and that pluralism means that it's, uh, people tolerate. Also, they tolerate and expect that you don't understand fully other people around you. Uh, and uh, the, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. So it's very interesting. But people are no, and you don't expect them to un, uh, that you will be fully understood by those people either. So that's very important thing. Another important thing, and this is coming from kind of uh, uh, Mrs. Kala Bakhtin, uh, society is very, very, very good for something uh, that my Ukrainian colleagues came this introduced this term uh, dialogue disagreement. Uh, they talk about very interesting two, two types of dialogues, which is very valuable. It's not like one is better than another, but it's very valuable dialogue agreement and dialogue disagreement. Uh, basically, if you want to uh, get a sense of that, dialogue agreement is when you need to build your kind of your baby. It's, uh, imagine that you have very fragile ideas. This is again, uh, it's not the full discussion of that dialogue agreement or dialogue disagreement, but imagine that you have a very kind of uh, very fragile ideas, very weak ideas in many ways. So you want to bring to the people uh, who are very close to you, who will not criticize them because you don't need their criticism. What you need to uh, nurturing, helping to this baby to grow, you need uh, support from them, not uh, criticism. And this is, uh, you need to build on each other kind of things. And this is what dialogue agreement is about. It's, it's you hear that it's a very communal thing, a dialogue agreement. Dialogue disagreement is uh, you facing actually a uh, hostile environment, but hostile not necessarily that uh, uh, dismiss you. It's reversing. It takes you very seriously, but in hostile manner. It's challenging you. It's trying to find holes in you. It's in disagree. And if you push uh, really to, uh, not to extreme, but to the further, to intensity of that, I would say, it will be a dialogue among uh, in irre irreconcilable paradigms. And if you think what's the purpose of dialogue, it's in my view, it's very important. It's dialogue with frenemies, friendly enemies. Uh, why is they friendly? Because they're not dismissing you and they don't want to destroy you in the, in the sense that they want to annihilate that. In this case, it's you're in agonistic relations, as political scientists would say. Not antagonistic, but agonistic. Agonistic means you disagree, but you still appreciate each other. And you feel to some degree that you uh, need each other because uh, the other side sometimes provides you blind spots. It's in a way, if you think about, again, political scientists say that in democratic society, political parties should be in agonistic relations, not in antagonistic relations, but in agonistic relations. Because you can say, I hate, let's say, Republicans, but I have sometimes suspicions that they can be very helpful because of showing me my blind spots. Also, sometimes they might have to agree at the end. Maybe sometimes even they're correct, they're right about something. And because they're coming from a, or maybe I'm moving too far and they may correct me in my uh, extremes, moving me from extremes or so on and so forth. So in a way you're treating them, not because you want to collaborate with them, no. It's the last thing that you want to do with, to collaborate with them. Not because you want to compromise them, no. 
but because you can, they can help you to self-growth. Uh, because again, by challenging you, you can say, "Ooh, I, ne I never thought about from this side," and I need to, I need to, feel, like, I need to reply to them, not to them, in a say, but to myself. How I, how I would reply to to this challenge? It's interesting challenge. I never thought about that. So this is what dialogue disagreement is. And society exactly provides that. Today just uh, yeah, uh, it comes to mind just uh, as an example, uh, the discussion between Einstein and Bohr about, yeah. yeah. And uh, thank you, Anna. This is a very excellent example. Uh, uh, let me uh, a little bit ex uh, extended, thanks. That's a good example. Uh, I, I was actually, uh, one of my previous professions were a physics teacher. So this kind of physics is very close to my heart. So uh, Einstein never, although it's a very interesting uh, historical fact, Einstein was founder of quantum mechanics, but he hated it. Because sure. he was, uh, we will be surprised, but Einstein was always a deterministic person, philosophically determinist. He hated, you know, he has this very famous statement, God does not flip coins uh, or uh, 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 flip uh, dice, I think. That's what he dice, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and he was very much against notion of probability, which is on quantum mechanics war, based on. And uh, Niels Bohr, who was another founder of the quantum mechanics, uh, were engaged with, uh, they engaged for many decades in extremely productive challenges of each other. Mostly Einstein was uh, challenging Bohr and Bohr was very happy about that because it took him several years to reply. By the way, it's based mostly on imaginary experiments, which is was very bizarre in their nature. I can give you one example. Well, one example, it's, uh, it's like that that uh, Bohr quantum mechanics predicted, uh, uh, and this is Einstein, Einstein trying to find that uh, impossible things. Uh, like for example, if one particle change in one place of universe, the other will change at the same time in absolutely remote, uh, many light uh, years away, millions, billions light away, change at the same time. That's what it predicted. And again, that was a bizarre outcome. And uh, Bohr actually took challenge and reply that it is possible. And believe it or not, many, many decades later, uh, there was experimental check of this and Bohr won that. It's not in style. But I'm just saying that, and it was extremely fruitful, this agonistic dialogue disagreement, extremely fruitful for physics because it's helped move forward physics, because that Einstein's challenges were super important for development of the uh, field. And it continues to be important. So this is what dialogue disagreement brings to that. That's kind of another thing. Uh, the third thing is very important what society brings is transcendence, transcendence culture. Uh, the, uh, the community community has uh, allows many degrees of freedom, but these degrees of freedom are very defined by the community. What's allowed to be free in the community? But it's very uh, uneasy, and actually not uneasy. It actually will can strike very strongly against transcendence of this bound of its own boundaries. Uh, by the way, if you ask like why community is doing that, it's exactly because for its strength, because it supports, it's uh, part of this, it provides nurturing. But this nurturing means, the, exactly this nurturing means that this nurturing is super important. In a way, uh, community, uh, uh, let me paraphrase very famous statement that attributed to uh, Aristotle. Aristotle said, uh, Plato is my friend, but the truth is <laughs> is bigger friend to me. By the way, that statement, in my view, it's a statement of the society. It's a statement of dialogue disagreement. But you can uh, create another statement, which is uh, some people do that. Uh, uh, like truth is important, but plight is more important for me because he is my friend. And this is exactly communal statement uh, that friendship and relationship more important 
the, um, all these disagreements all together. And that keeps community together. And that creates a very strong uh, uh, boundaries around that, which is very difficult to transcend uh, unless you want to destroy your community. You should be very careful uh, in uh, getting close to these boundaries, especially transcending, transcending them. So um, it's almost, uh, so, so where I'm uh, going from that, uh, uh, I'm uh, at the end of my paper and considering very interesting situations in my classes uh, with this notion where is the tension between uh, community and uh, society. Uh, uh, because again, I'm not saying that community is not important. That's the last thing that I want to say. I just say that normatively for joint self, uh, self education is a not a good norm. And if you push that norm, usually this norm leads to what I call progressive education. And uh, community, so community of learners is uh, as a norm, uh, not as a practice, but as a norm, it leads to progressive education. It will not, uh, it's not lead to uh, democratic education. And democratic education, uh, kind of requires the norm of the society and not community. And again, uh, some um, democratic education, when it starts based on the community, claiming it's community, it's sliding to the progressivism, progressive education. Uh, so this is basically, maybe on that I should stop because we can also consider like what tensions I had in my uh, classes and we can talk about that if it's interesting. But maybe now you, by now you have an, uh, like a gist of the ideas and we can work. And I think, Anna, you want to say something and feel free now to yeah, ask. I just uh, uh, wanted to add that uh, or ask that uh, uh, the, the norm of a community pro, uh, demands limits of uh, uh, what's uh, legitimate to pursue or how to see, while the norm of normativism of society is limitless. Yeah, in this case, yes. Uh, yes, and of course, yes and no, in the sense that, of course, society or city can be destroyed. Um, so, and it can be destroyed <clears throat> by two kind of forces, and this is I described in the, in, in the paper. Uh, one uh, strong uh, thing is one of the community uh, start dominating and try to suppress other communities in diversity in the city. So in this case, city uh, either can become uh, like giant big com community or it's split uh, because I had to say goodbye, we don't want to be with you anymore. And another thing is uh, when uh, this uh, 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 union of the communities that constituting city uh, will find that they don't want to be together for different reasons because they find uh, that uh, the synergy that uh, it's not beneficial for them anymore and they can leave the city. This is kind of peaceful way to also to say goodbye. By the way, I like definition of the city as a peaceful coexistence of the community, diverse communities. Peaceful coexistence mm -hmm. and with the synergy. It's not just coexistence, uh, they mutual benefiting from the coexistence. And again, uh, I really uh, say that this book uh, uh, by David Graber, you need to go, sorry. Oh, Dana, you need, uh, Dina, you need to go. Sorry to miss you. I miss you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so this is an uh, interesting point, yes. But the city itself, as a normative, it, it limitless, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. why it can incorporate even new communities that will come and join the city. And uh, by the way, one of the theory why Asian Rome was so powerful, become a very powerful city because its pluralism was much stronger than let's say pluralism of the Greek policies. Mm -hmm. what, what I would like to also, also uh, kind of like, uh, I read the Graeber's book, uh, The Dawn of Everything. And one of the very astonishing and for me very important aspects of this uh, yeah, uh, issue is that uh, potentially these first cities 
uh, that were democratic or, or 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 kind of union of peaceful different communities were not permanent. They were temporary. Like half a year, you live like that, and another half of year, the community split and wander. Or so it's, it was at the time when they were so so called wander gatherer societies, and this duality of the ways of life. Um, uh, which is uh, a legitimate duality. We are neither living in the city nor only in community, but we can incorporate both is something very important, I think, for this plurality because it it, it allows not only for tolerance, but it, it allows for, for, for another uh, point of view, kind of spring of, about what's good, what's bad. Uh, and it's a, uh, conditionality like it's good in the summertime but it's not good in the winter time or something like that uh, and um, I was uh, why for me is uh, that important is another thing is that we create these different points of view sometimes and they say about that in the form of carnival for instance when everything gets turned around because we became permanent cities or permanent um, societies that have this or that value and we are kind of trapped even within the plurality maybe of the city in one way of legitimizing everything. And uh, th this is for me where this uh, uh, being able to break the or transcend whatever the mode of uh, thinking life or uh, self-directing is uh, a possibility to either carnivalize or uh, create a, uh, imaginary stages. We have uh, books, uh, movies, uh, uh, theaters, or play, children's play. So I'm not sure uh, whether that kind of like plays the same role as being able to uh, to 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 actually move away peacefully and then move away back peacefully into from communities to society and from society back to the communities and in the, uh, let me reply to that <clears throat> this is a good point and in my view valid but again very important what i'm talking about in my articles on norm because you it doesn't matter what you did presenting as temporary city but mm -hmm. it's an idea the norm of the city this is a norm of the city not norm of the community <clears throat> Mm -hmm. One thing that I want to add to this, uh, as uh, again, Bakhtinian scholar, for me, it was very interesting to uh, uh, notion of the voice, especially uh, developing voice, uh, promoting voice of the students. <clears throat> and when I was uh, kind of was a proponent of the notion of normative notion of community, um, back then reading Bakhtin helped me uh, to develop this notion, what I call community behind as a very strong voice. I, I, I uh, Bakhtin make a, by the way, comment, very interesting. It's a, in his book on Dostoevsky, it's a, his note. It's not in this uh, main body of the book, but it's, it's his note. It's not somebody making a note. He, and I forgot why he made this note particular, but the note was very interesting. He said, uh, you know, ba Bakhtin studied Dostoevsky, and he noticed, uh, many people noticed, it's not only Bakhtin, but many people noticed that heroes of the, or characters of Bakhti, of the Dostoevsky novels, it's kind of what uh, in Russia it's called underground people. People in between, socially, we're talking about so a social class. It's in between class people. It's not middle class, by the way. It's, uh, English doesn't have this notion of the, or not English, but life in, in the West doesn't have that strong notion of people in between. By the way, the another person who developed this is W. Uh, du Bois about people, black people in the United States. He defined them almost in the same way. He didn't use the term, Russian term, underground people, but he developed a people in between. It's people who don't have like peace of the, uh, of the being yourself, comfortable being in yourself in the social, in, in the social milieu. In the United States, like black people were not feeling that. Uh, another person who tried to capture that outside of Russia, it's uh, Kurt Lewin, uh, who's a psychologist, German psychologist. He described uh, 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 Jews 
uh, in Europe as uh, he introduced the notion of marginal people, but it's actually the same. By the way, Du Bois, I want to bring Du Bois notion, double consciousness. You call about this double consciousness. Uh, in Russia, it was called in 19th century. It was well reflected. And it's, uh, uh, it's very difficult to say in between people, that one term, and underground people. It's another uh, uh, thing. Uh, in my view, it's one phenomena. And uh, basically, the observation that Bakhtin made that people like this don't have strong voice. And in that note, he compared people with uh, aristocracy. Again, he talks about Russian aristocracy. And he said, people with ar aristocracy, they have very strong voice. And I was uh, thinking about that in my book that published 2009, I introduced this notion of community behind. And this is, I try to say that, that, that aristocracy has very strong community behind. And what does it mean community behind? It's exactly this kind of communal things that People take very seriously and in and in, in very supportive way what you're saying. And people who don't have strong community behind, they create this phenomena that Dostoevsky captured very well in his novels and stories, which is this excessive dialogicity when you constantly hear a hostile voice like, who are you to say that? Or it's constantly hostile voice which makes people inarticulate. By the way, I saw it my students. They very some of them inarticulate and for different reasons because I, I, you can reading their text, you can see that uh, hostile voice on which he they constantly replying, which they, it's very difficult to understand when, when what they saying because they it's it's this constant dialogue going on and, and, and usually in the writing you see fragments of this dialogue. When you talk to them, it's much easier to hear these hostile voices than in the writing. But in the writing, it's very incomprehensible because you see fragments of this hostile uh, dialogue that they're replying to, hostile voices that they're replying to. And uh, exactly, community behind creates this, um, it makes a voice, your voice strong. And the voice you should understand in broader sense. It's, not, it's like what you're doing. It's like you you much have less self doubts. This this kind of hostility creates these doubts in yourself. Whatever you do, it's not necessarily even speaking in your actions as well. Uh, you you don't have unity of your action and mobilization yourself for this action because at the same time it's very. Um, consuming things to constantly reply to the hostile voices that undermines whatever you're doing. And in this case, I created the community uh, behind. And again, this is a very, as you say, even a notion is about community. It's uh, unconditional support of you, nurturing of you. Mm -hmm. I think maybe yeah. in English they say, who is holding your back? Uh, well, I like community behind much better. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a much uh, yeah, uh, much. No, stronger. no, it's much. It's uh, community behind is much better than uh, this. Uh, in my view, that metaphor. Plus, it's it's exactly indicating that it's a. This is constitute what community constitutes. That it's it's on, uh, going on many ways. When you have doubts, you bring that to to the your community, and the community soothes you and say no. Like you're strong, you're not weak. When you have in pain, you're coming to those people that are close to you and they soothe you, and so on and so forth. When you have like, is it like have value or not have? They say, sure, it is have value. And there, in a way, what's important is it's uh, unconditional but rather sincere. By the way, I prepare for you if you're interested in that to show a video about the power of community behind. It's actually, uh, uh, it's a kind of a documentary, but a fictional documentary. It's kind of <laughs> dramatized what's really happened, let me say, put that way. And it's a movie based on the absolutely highly recommend uh, novel. It's actually, it's, it's not even novel. It's a, uh, yeah, it can be called novel because it's a combination of those different stories combined together, autobiographical. Uh, Tammy, uh, uh, it's Amy uh, Tan, Amy Tan, it's called uh, Joy, Joy Luck Club. She's um, uh, Chinese American. She grew up in San Francisco. Her mother grew up in China. And this is uh, uh, this episode about her cousin 
who uh, was uh, in uh, the whole thing happened in the 50s. And this is again, this is the movie. I recommend you to read the book and also watch the movie. In my view, the movie is also very good and, uh, and the book is great and they uh, complement each other, I would say. <laughs> uh, they're not uh, spoiling each other or one is kind of better than another. I would say both of them very nice. Eugene, uh, so, Eugene, I was gonna, I was gonna ask that because uh, you just started saying that the community behind was unconditional, mm -hmm. but it sounds, but in the example that you're of the Joy Luck Club, isn't it that you discover that it is conditional? Uh, no, no, it's it's interesting because of course uh, uh, I'm going to that. Thanks, Abram. It is uh, remember where a community it has boundaries. It's unconditional within these boundaries. When you start challenging the boundaries. You, it's whole thing is breaking. And this is exactly where you see the power of the community and power of the community behind. Because it's within the, uh, it's unconditional within the boundaries. It's very good point, Abram, you're saying. It's not, <laughs> that unconditionality has boundaries, which has become almost contradiction in terms. But I like that contradiction in terms because it shows this, uh, it's like unconditional love, except when you cross the boundaries, you know, it it become conditional, but within boundaries it's conditional. Again, it sounds like misnomer, but it's important communal misnomer. This is where tensions of the community. We will stay behind you, whenever. You, I love you as my child, whenever. But there is boundary of that <laughs> of this love. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this has happened in the 50s, and uh, this girl become um, a little girl. Actually, in the novel, it started like, she, uh, you know, uh, in the movie, it the time is compressed. In the uh, novel, it's actually uh, took what you see very compressed events. It's actually happened for uh, several years, okay? Just uh, because in the movie, you cannot do that well, uh, like uh, you, you have to dramatize, you have to sacrifice something. So let's watch that and um, then maybe uh, discuss that. And then I want to shift after that, how society contributes to the voice, because this is how community contributes to that. And then I'll uh, discuss how society, okay. Now I have at uh, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, what's going on? Uh, you know, I'm trying to share that, but is it, no, what's going, you know, my computer is misbehaving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, you know what, <coughs> you know what is misbehaving, I cannot, it doesn't allow me to share, uh, it's allow me to share screen, but not a uh, window. Okay, so, uh, let me share the screen and then just get to that. Uh... So in my view, this is a very a nice, I have actually another video, but it's much more dramatic uh, to see this power of this uh, community and informing and supporting the voice and again this voice is not in this case talking voice it's about uh, playing chess and i was thinking like how community uh, society contributes to the building voice and it contributes completely different way than uh this community behind it's kind of uh, let me give another story unfortunately i don't have a video if you have an, any video that can uh, illustrate that. I was uh, <clears throat> will be nice to uh, to see that to visualize. The story is look, uh, like that. And Ternell, uh, maybe you know that story. And I'm talking to you because you're in Europe because it's a very European story. Uh, I've learned it from um, one interesting uh, scholar who was uh, like a poem. Bakhtin didn't like him. Uh, Viktor Shklovsky, who was uh, one of the founder of formalism and or structuralism what later became structuralism linguist, in ling linguistics <clears throat> so he said the story was like that at the beginning of 20th century uh, wrestling was extremely popular actually i know that because uh, grandfather of my uh, wife was a wrestler 
and I wish uh, I knew him because he died before uh, I met my wife. And but I've, I've heard so many stories from from my wife about that, and uh, it was super popular in Europe, and including in Russia and many other countries. So they have uh, uh, like contest, and they called it a world contest. Of course, in reality, it was mostly European. Uh, business. It was not world, but it was considered world. And in the beginning of 20th century, it became extremely corrupt, which means the uh, uh, the, <laughs> the fights were rigged and fixed in order to, and fighters were getting money for so-called win or lose. Depends on the you know, beats that the people were doing that. And of end, uh, the wrestlers themselves in European wrestlers, they wanted to know who is really, really, really uh, champion of the world. You know, of course, it's Europe. And so they secretly, every year, they secretly meet in the German city of Hamburg to have absolutely secret matches because, of course, they want uh, uh, to keep it away from public and to establish who is a real, uh, real uh, winner, champion of the world. In wrestlers, in wrestling, and at some point, I think it's uh, before World War One, somebody reported to that that it was a big scandal. People learned about Hamburg meetings, and after that, it became a saying. Uh, at least it's it's very common in Russia right now, uh, according to Hamburg account. So you you, for example, let's say you uh, praising me for something, and I can ask you, is it according to Hamburg account? Uh, or uh, so it it means how things really are. You want to know that, and in my view, using this uh, saying, uh, this society contributes to building voice with this notion of the according to Hamburg account. When you're meeting challenge, real challenge, and figure out where you are. The, the community behind helps you to nurture things, to give you confidence. But this confidence really will be tested in this Hamburg account. Like, like this girl going to this uh, meeting with the strong chess players. This is, they're not in the unconditional support, no. <laughs> they're an unconditional challenge. But it's important, nevertheless, the challenge is by acceptance, you're taking you seriously. In this case, they're, it's not like they're dismissing you, but they're taking you seriously and checking who you are, regardless, by the way, do you see that? Regardless your age, regardless your gender, I just want to remind you, this is 50s in the United States, very sexy society. And... Uh, uh, and the playing chess was considered to be a man's uh, business. And the fact that the girl was playing, and by the way, she is on the cover of magazine. By the way, in the book, they say what what's, was the title. Is she, uh, the title was saying, is she going to be first female uh, 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 grandmaster in chess? That the, was the title of the article in the, in the Life magazine about this girl. I don't know, you couldn't see this in the movie about that, but that's what they say. So regardless of that, uh, this kind of Hamburg account is checking. It doesn't matter who you are, what's your social background, uh, but we're testing you, you're taking it seriously, maybe one time, but we're taking you seriously and we see uh, what you can demonstrate to us. And, and we will, and again, it's Hamburg, which means and there is no rigging. The whole thing will be without any rigging. So it will be an honest uh, test. And this is what I think part of this, this is very important for uh, development of your voice, <clears throat> but this is what society can bring, this testing in the, and, and building your voice, uh, uh, according to Hamburg account in this case, not community behind. And I'm not saying one is better than another. I'm just saying they, in a way, they nicely uh, complement each other. And again, city, uh, it's not in opposition to community. City is opposition to mono community. If you think about normatively, what city or society, uh, it's opposition to the mono.
like for example in this girl she unfortunately cannot switch from one community that's supporting her chess voice to another community and uh, that's why in a way it's interestingly like her voice collapsed because of her community withdraw that support what i call unconditional support <laughs> by the way it's very important to see that her mother was not a chess player so in this case it's not necessarily uh, support that's coming in the kind of conceptually or in whatever way no uh, eugene i just both i like hearing you talk and talk through your thinking and i just keep putting things in the chat here i just uh, i'm wondering what you think of this idea of uh like rum springer in the amish communities so mm -hmm. they have like the devil's playground year where they get like a gap year from the community and they get an op opportunity to, to decide to leave the community but for good as I'm, I'm just wondering how that fits in with your example of community behind because it, it um it's it feels like it gives them an experience of what it's like what how what your experience of yourself is like when you don't have the force of the community behind you similar to me and I'm not sure if like the Amy Tan example with, with the mother there withholding it, uh, her care. I, I don't know. I, I found that troubling actually because of the way that she was like, well, you don't care about us, we don't care about you. And she's just like giving the child the silent treatment seems like a kind of not just not giving you this community sort of thing, but it's, it seemed like something actually violently negative as opposed to where the rum springer might be something kind of like, all right, you know that this is coming up, this is gonna be a rite of passage, you'll have this experience. Where, so you could still have your example of the Amy Tan, and then maybe the rum springer gives you an, another example to show you that it's not just like, it's not just the, the consequences of withholding motherly love or something. <laughs> Well, to some degree, it's interesting because it could be similar, <coughs> view similarly, because you exactly, uh, the idea to some degree, you can read in different ways this Amish experiences, but almost it's the idea to show that you are nothing without uh, everybody else, which is the same, same message, but it done in kind of uh, almost sneakier way. This one is uh, very in your face. You, uh, the lesson is in your face. And there, the lesson is a very sneaky way. Uh, and, uh, and I don't know uh, which is actually tougher. I, I'm actually questioning uh, who is more cruel, uh, this uh, Amy Tank kind of things versus, uh, versus uh, Amish people. Again, that's, again, and uh, of course I'm biased in this case because of course I have particular values of the, uh, as you can see, I'm a very city person. Uh, and I very much uh, value the city experiences rather than community. I value community experience, but within the city, embedded in the city, but not in their, in their own power. And I think that kind of, uh, um, some people have very happy life in the community and I understand that, but uh, <laughs> uh, this idea of being outliers and uh, challenging the boundaries of the community, for me personally, very important. So I don't know. Uh, you know what, what's interesting is, in, uh, there is, uh, in Amy Tang case, it's a clash of the uh, cultures, or, or if not civilizations, in a way. It's become Chinese and American culture, there is a clash that's part of that. <clears throat> what's important is that American, uh, and I can criticize that, of course, as well, there is so much, uh, it makes invisible community. And it makes an invisible community behind and makes uh, people achievement uh, uh, mm, at, uh, attributed to individual at expense of the community. Uh, let me uh, provide a very good example of a uh, sociolinguist, Eleanor Osh. She studied uh, 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 different communities and she noticed extremely interesting things, how a mother and child play in different communities. 
uh, in American communities, uh, usually, and again, of course, United States is diverse. We're talking about mainstream uh, and mostly middle class. Uh, again, let me not to continue this line. You understand what I'm talking about. Uh, so in many ways, when, when uh, they play together and they build something together, the very young child and the mother, uh, when something is achieved, achieved by them together, the mother says, wow, great, look what you've done. She makes her own contribution invisible uh, while emphasizing contributions of her child and, and attributing her efforts and her contributions to the child. It's done by solo by the child. In many other communities that she studies, actually a mother makes very clear and visible uh, these contributions by other people. And for example, when, uh, so for example, when uh, uh, they do, they're working together, uh, the mother thanks the child and the child thanks mother for help, for doing things together. Mm -hmm. And this almost ritual that everything's happened like that, that the child always helps other people who contributed. And that contribution can be very indirect, like in this particular case by the chess. And Chinese culture is very much, uh, I'm a little bit, uh, was uh, not, I didn't study that, but a little bit uh, were in contact. I was in China with my students and we talked about Chinese students and I'm teaching in China. And we talked about that and they say it's so true. Uh, it sometimes happens in opposite direction. Like you see a little bit in the movie that it become a little bit oppressive. The fact that it's fully, you, you constantly uh, living life for the community, not for yourself. There is no contribution by yourself. It's you can you do it, and any transgression it means it's not your transgression. It's transgression on the most important for your community, and it creates a lot of um, uh, how to say that manipulation possibility and control, social control. Mm -hmm. By the way, which can come, which can be exploited by the state, for example, mm -hmm. and it did happen like that but it's constantly you feel constantly obligated because you're constantly with other people and you constantly feel you owe to other people all the time or because not in the sense and it's not transactional all but this is uh, this is kind of like the biggest value is the community not you mm -hmm. There is a, yeah, uh, in preschool education, uh, especially uh, people who work with very small children, this, uh, they even call it early childhood education and care, ECC, uh, uh, that uh, strong uh, push for this care part. And it's almost sacrilege to tell, uh, to, to start discussing the dark sides of this, uh, yeah, exactly the, uh, the 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 community trying to keep you within community. You you're hitting these walls if you don't conform to the community. It's mm -hmm. it's uh, binding as much as it's caring. But saying it today in the, the Western literature, trying to to uh, bring that aspect uh, of uh, care in the early childhood education is almost no no. We, how can you be no love or no care? Like this is necessary, and nobody denies that. <laughs> it's it's like the interesting notion of uh, uh, comfort and conformity, and the go can go very close together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Eugene, would you say that in Western societies, is some of that community is is hidden with the individualism and the individualism is kind of an illusion where the people have power to grant awards, whether it's trophies, mm -hmm. medals, plaques, or promotions, and whatever else. Yep. Um, they don't reward people who rise up against them, right? No, no, look at this, they, uh, think about that. Uh, they, uh, there is usually a communal and collective uh, contribution, but there's one person who is awarded and recognized. And in uh, this kind of, yes, yeah, I would say, uh, let's call it Western society, which is, I don't know what exactly Western, <laughs> you know, especially looking at the globe, what does it mean West? <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> sometimes I think West. this illusion of individuality is maintained. Yeah, it is. 
right. is it is a myth in a way there is no such thing in this notion of individualism is a myth uh, because in my view uh, it, that's why you see that's now you understand why you call normative this is a normative notion it's not how things are but it's normative but they extremely consequential this normative things mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, the community is constantly stolen from uh in western societies uh, uh again but on the other hand, in the Eastern European societies, community it's, it's, is too oppressive. Exactly, exactly. It's oppressing uh, people. By the way, what's interesting is uh, that, uh, again, um, it's not about East and West because I didn't study that much about that. But let me, Slavic uh, languages, there is other terms possible, unlike, uh, like say, uh, English or uh, French or Italian or... Uh, and it's so difficult to get out of this uh, continuum in uh, West, like about individual versus society. Basically, it's not society, it's community. By the way, it's constantly, uh, when they say society, it's actually, or social, they means community. It's not really a society. Uh, and that's that's kind of very interesting for me. But in uh, Slavic language, there is notion of личность, which is it's not in between of the, it's away from that continuum, which is uh, a roughly personality, but uh, it has yeah, the, it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this outside definition that it's not only what's inside you, like it's uh, assumed in a uh, Western or in English definition of personality. It's something that's constructed and that's very much social. And it comes also from the Greek, uh, uh, from the notion of mask. Lichinus or lichinum is a mass, something that you show to other people. What other Again, it doesn't matter. The origin is not important. Uh, the things that's coming close when you say human rights, uh, this is actually coming closer to uh, this Slavic notion of this, the third, which is called lichinist, uh, which is coming. It's a... Uh, it, in this notion, it's recognized uh, this uh, communal contributions uh, very much. At the same time, it's not reduced to that. Still, re responsibility is on that uh, on the person, which at the same time do not see. Well, you know, individual means uh, at atomistic. That's uh, you know not recognition of the any uh, indivisible, uh, not, not recognition any contribution of other people in whatever you're doing, in whatever your great uh, or terrible things you're doing mm -hmm. or saying. About the, uh, this uh, uh, notion that there is a, uh, everything could be ascribed to an individual uh, author, but uh, not recognize the big community that uh, is contributing to the whatever the individual is attributing is a really very good uh, uh, in, in a book by uh, Becker, Art Worlds, where he examines different art worlds where the product of the art uh, of some person means sometimes centuries of development. Sorry about this, I have to... Oops. <laughs> Things happen. Mm -hmm. There is somebody near me making noise. Um, let if it's a uh, picture, uh, the the artist needs to find the pigments, uh, the canvas, the many many things that go into the final products that are products of other people, research of other people, art of other people, and he talks about both visual and musical arts. But the, the, he has even even poetry uh, is not maybe a product only of one person work <laughs> what do you mean even poetry or anything well, uh, he, he uses poetry. that as kind of like quintessential thinking of uh, there sits a poet and writes his thoughts uh, her thoughts or whatever <laughs> yeah well, as, as Bakhtin commented uh nobody invents uh words you or rarely you invent words that you're using including poets uh it's a somebody else's invention uh, Yes, and, and no. Uh, think about that. This is notion of transcendence, which is I always use that. But transcendence based on the idea that uh, there is some material pre-existed. 
So whatever, that creativity is never started from zero, but from something that's already there, and uh, which means you need to say, need to be thankful for other people who brought this uh, in life. And then when they say poet creates its own language, yes, but uh, they create their own language based on language out of other people. And uh, yeah, and uh, thanks, uh -huh, thanks Anna, for this. So transcendence is always transcendence of something. It's not uh, from the nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not like I, I made some notes while we're and put them in the chat here. Um, mm -hmm. a comment I made earlier was about philosophy with children. There's like a, an ongoing, I'm just thinking about it in terms of the way that you've made this distinction between community and society and the mm -hmm. idea of dialogic disagreement as being active within society and not so much in the norm of community, right? Um, there's even though they're not using like a distinction of kind of terms, they use this idea of the community of philosophical inquiry in, um, in uh, philosophy with children, community of philosophical inquiry coming out of like the pragmatist notion of a community of inquirers arriving at truth in the long run, um, coming out of, what is that purse? But the, What's interesting is that within the theorizing around community of, uh, of philosophy with children, using this notion of community, that notion of community, there's been a lot of tension internally about pretty similar kind of tension between the way you've conceptualized community and society because, so there's like three C's, there's creative, uh, critical, creative, and collaborative dialogue <laughs> or maybe it's no it's it's caring so the thing is that there's been these schisms within the p4c community where they wanted to add in a fourth one which is collaborative thinking so that the aim of doing philosophy with children is to encourage critical thinking creative thinking and caring thinking and then uh the group the kind of British strand that came out of that when it sort of they've added in a fourth C which is collaborative thinking which is a lot closer to this norm and the people following the kind of uh, earlier Matt Lippman or whatever this this model that was developed here in New Jersey and whatever they have really pushed back against that for exactly the reasons that you've described about there's this problem with the ideal of the community um, because then we end up with groupthink and that's, that's antithetical to this notion of arriving at some kind of a truth. And why would you have critical thinking if you're just going to then move towards groupthink? Yeah, yeah, this is really interesting because um, if you think about this whole enterprises, this communal enterprises that always try to define what the hell we are about and trying to define, oh, we're about critical thinking or we're about this, we're about that. And this is not a society or a city approach because city and society doesn't have goal. Uh, we just get together and see what will happen. We kind of uh, have synergy of being together. Uh, we are in peace with each other. We know that we're different and we not necessarily uh, will try to define well, like, what the hell we're about. <laughs> uh, the city doesn't have agenda. And it might temporarily come to that, but it will be considered as temporarily, it doesn't pre-exist in advance. Because as soon as you start defining that, you're exactly trying to create this boundary uh, of, of, and which makes it become very difficult to transcend or almost put you in the situation like in this movie that we would, that it's about traitor. Who is the, the one who's trying to do it, become a traitor of our mission. By defining mission, you're defining traitors of the mission who will betray the mission. Actually, you just remind me, I just back into anthropology, I'm trying to remember what her name is. There's this book on the concept of the relation in English. Uh, 
Hargrave is really... I, <laughs> what's her name? What's her, I'll, I'll try to remember her name, but the point is that there's something in the concept of the relation in English in particular that moves towards a norm of agreement. It's like, it's a, uh, I guess I'm getting kind of lost here, but the idea here is that there's something here related to relational pedagogy. And when I say, I get, did an example of it there. I said it's related to, so there's a positive conception of relation. Relation is always something that is positive. It's like, like is also that not have anything in common with something is also a relation, right? Technically it's like positive or negative, but we tend to think of relation in the positive sense. <laughs> I'm trying to think why, why the spark jumped off there, but it was something to do with, there's some connection here to the notion of community and relate relatedness to collaborate, to be in relation with others, to, you know, presupposes the norm. The idea, I guess, is that the norm is, the normative ideal is deeper than just the word community. It's in the, in the, the normative ideal might exist at the very idea of like epistemic mm -hmm. relation. Mm -hmm. So that in schooling contexts, we're going to be drawn more towards these positive, uh, yeah, positive, positive, affirmative kind of relations. I, I don't know. I'm, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, just spitballing there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, maybe I can illustrate, the, maybe, I don't know, is it what you're trying to say or not, but with interesting example that's happened in my classes, and actually, Brian participated in almost like two events, as a, uh, one, he was a student, and another was an uh, observer. I had a class with Brian participated, it was a graduate class. Uh, Brian, I told you when, I wrote down when it was, but now I forgot. I think it's probably 10 years ago. Maybe... Uh, or maybe not. Uh, uh, now I forgot already. But I documented that because I was uh, for the article I put that in the paper because I tracked that. So anyway, it was a graduate class, and uh, rather quickly uh, in my classes in that time, one aspect of being a democratic class, and in, in that sense of the people. Uh, uh, in defining a self-education, that uh, in this class people were uh, voting on what they want to study. So there was a big list of the possible topics and uh, for the class, and uh, by the way, students can add new topics, and they did. There is, by the way, the list is growing uh, for each particular class, and the students, uh, usually at the end of the class, sometimes at the beginning of the class, decide what to study next. And in this class, very quickly, actually, I thought it was longer. In my memory, it was long, it took uh, almost in the middle semester. No, it's happened almost like in uh, first three weeks. It became very clear that the class, uh, the uh, kind of split on three groups, uneven groups, and two groups were defined two irreconcilable paradigms in uh, social sciences you can call in psychology and education. So one group was can be defined by information processing approach. And another, by the way, the groups agree with that kind of things. And another group was defined by uh, sociocultural. And Brian was actually belonging to sociocultural approach. And, uh, and the third group was in between, or un, uh, uncommitted in a way, who were interested in both paradigms. So what's happened was that, uh, that uh, uh, this paradigm of information processing paradigm has few more people than sociocultural, which means uh, that when they were voting on the topic, uh, it became more and more uh, topics they were selecting were more interesting for people who were in information processing paradigm than people who are in sociocultural which led to uh, 
actually, again, my memory is correct because I check emails. There was one student from sociocultural paradigm came to me and she was really pissed off. And she said, Eugene, uh, I might not want to stop coming to the class because I don't want to study information processing approach. I'm interested in socioculture. So I brought back to the class, we had discussion and one student, it's really interesting. Uh, actually, it's much more interesting what I found in our email exchanges than I actually my memory set. Because uh, he actually proposed that each student should select their own topic. And I actually, so, so in a way our class were collapsing in a way by that. Like each person should select their own topic. And uh, uh, I thought, this is a great idea. Let's try to do that. Uh, I brought that back to the class. Again, I don't know, unfortunately, there is no record how it was discussion. I know the re result of that discussion. The result of the discussion, people disagree that we should select each uh, people decide their own topic and study in a way it become like class split on individual. There is no class anymore. They study by themselves. They didn't like this idea, uh, but they decided these two groups, paradigmatic groups, should select their own topics. And we did this and people like that and we did it. So imagine that the class was split in two groups. By the way, the people in between could choose what to join group because, by the way, that's on their uh, choice because they didn't want to have third group. They wanted to have two groups. and. And the study, of course, since I cannot help being both groups at the same time, they selected for each uh, group, uh, they selected a leader of the group who is usually proposing the topic. And the topic won for the group, but they thought, okay, since you propose the topic, it means you're more interested in the topic than anybody else, so it's your responsibility to prepare. And they were calling me, I, I compare myself with a bee, flying to the between two flowers. Also, uh, the, and I, again, Brian, maybe you have any memory of that. Did it happen immediately or it was with some time because I couldn't find this, uh, any documentation of that. But they also in institutionalized um, 20 minutes at the end of the class, they get together and share what they discussed. Okay. Yeah, I don't, well, I think that and also the forming of separate groups, um, what, what's still held there is this idea of a, a class and a community. And I think there was some hesitation to let go yeah. of that. It would be abnormal not to meet as a class and somehow unify the experience. And unfortunately, I don't remember exact discussions, how, like, what was there. I, I know I have this documentation that uh, at, in a few weeks, they increase this uh, from 20 minutes to 30 minutes. And I know why, because they, in email, it was, uh, 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 they saying reason, because they don't want just um, reporting what they discussed, but a little bit discussion about these two each topics. So it was a very interesting, in my view, uh, this is a very interesting uh, where the tension uh, led to very clear emergence of the two distinguished communities within our society, many society. And also there is a whole idea of the synergy and there is a place uh, that almost like a, a plaza, you know, public plaza when we can meet together which was initially 20 minutes and then they moved to the 30 minutes when they meet and have to discuss this. Uh, but they, by the way, it was very interesting. We had a class, I still remember. Sometimes they choose, one group choose to show uh, a video or something. And the other usually look at that what they, or sometimes they eavesdropping because there is such a passion discussion and they eavesdrop about what's, what's going on in another group. And sometimes almost the discussion in their own groups almost went down because they want to hear what's going on in another group. And sometimes, but sometimes they just keep discussing what it is. And um, so it was very, in my view, very interesting. Um, uh, this uh, whole 
uh, movement of the class as like very distinguished society with the two groups, two uh, communities had, by the way, the communities developed their own uh, uh, norms, rituals, traditions, uh, way of communications, and uh, many different things. Like, for example, I remember in one group, there was, uh, you cannot, uh, one person talk, you cannot uh, interrupt this person, and another group, you can interrupt. By the way, you can guess which group it was. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> because it's, it's to some degree reflects paradigm behind that. Uh, because this communicational norm. But mm Eugene, -hmm. uh, th this discussion of the community as a relatively uniform matter is something I got to dig more into. And I, I listen to what you say about unity and community. But in this particular case, you have uh, different groups of students who are precisely uh, producing their own communities in strong dialogue and in probably in opposition to the other communities in the class. So, so the thing about uniformity, it would I would assume mm -hmm. that this has nothing to do with stability or or identity, but has something to do with a, some kind of continued. Uh, dialogue and conflict and opposition with the other groups uh, um, and I would assume that a community contains that but there you replace uh, the concept of community with a um, micro society no it's that not micro community is okay. not micro society not at all but okay. it's important not to caricature community because community have uh, some of them have kind of more degree of freedom inside of that and some less. And so they have degree of freedoms. Like, for example, this community of the uh, information processing and socioculture within them, you can see some uh, important discussion, important differences within them, but it's not microcosm. Uh, and uh, they don't want to divide in the smaller things, uh, not, not necessarily. Uh, but uh, uh, the, what constitutes community is clear boundary. This is like, it is information processing approach. Within information processing approach, there is a lot of richness. It's not like one person thinks exactly like another person. No. Like, for example, in this particular class, I remember, uh, there was very strong version of, socio, uh, of uh, community, of, I'm sorry, uh, information processing, constructivist information processing approach. This idea of emergence. And they have algorithm, algorithmistic uh, information processing approach, which is another strong. And there was very interesting discussions that they had, and they are extremely interested in each other. As, and they feel that it's important part of their community. The same thing in the sociocultural approach. We had like uh, uh, different flavors of sociocultural approach uh, that people were gravitating towards, uh, but they were extremely interested in each other. Like, there were some people were social justice interested in social, and some didn't interested in social within sociocultural approach and social justice. But they really thought that they were together, um, and they were very, and there were clear boundaries between, like, uh, like for example, if <laughs> if in between people start pushing who are in this from something else from another paradigm, they say mm, maybe you should join them, maybe you should. We don't okay, I, I can easily understand can, that that yeah, you operate with yeah. there's uh, them. yeah there's something that define the group and then there's uh, the non there's a, there's a, a, a yeah. and then there's a non a can, you can yeah, say yeah. and of course that that gives profile to the each groups but my argument was just that um, that that is uh, a big supporter or a big resource in order to define your race, uh, to to define your own standpoint, to define your own community, is precisely that dialogue with what you are not. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. L like for example, it's very interesting if you read uh, Amy Tang book. No, it's not in the movie. Uh, but if you read, it's uh, this kind of Chinese community of that uh, girl, Weverly, was very non-traditional. 
in a sense, uh, and it was fine. Like, for example, because she was a uh, champion uh, or playing chess so well and pushing the community so strongly, elevating the community, not only family, but the whole Chinese community. This girl had completely different gender role than in traditional Chinese community was. And everybody, there was a big issue of discussion in family and outside the family. For example, she in, in the movie, she had one brother, but actually she has two brothers, both of them older than her. And in the family, all the chores, which is usually assigned to the girls, were assigned to the boys. Mm. Because she considered to be important member of the community. And that's why her role start emerging within this and within the family and outside the family and very non-traditional from gender roles from that point of view. Uh, and so you see, it was not homogeneity in this sense. Uh, so community is not this kind of, uh, it's very important not caricature it because especially yeah. life community, of course, normative community is another thing when we say, exactly. it, which yeah. is, uh, which is, uh, and a life of the community is very complex. It's not like that. Mm, sim and of course, when we say it's uh, uh, stable, it's, uh, I should be better say relatively stable because uh, any community is never staying. Like in this particular case, it was uh, because of this girl and because of the mother and many other things of the chess and place in the chess in the society and so on and so forth. It's a... Uh, you will see transformation of even that community when brothers suddenly were responsible for laundry and uh, uh, washing dishes and cleaning the house. And the girl was exempt and she was giving her own room and boys have to live together, which is again, it was not how it traditionally was done. And many things so that that family were very, was, was transforming because of that. So it was not that. And it's, Nevertheless, I claim that it's this community. It is life of the community. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I think your point is very good, mm -hmm. Neil. You should be I careful think, yeah. from caricaturing. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, also a very interesting idea, and you just said it in a different way. If you define your mission, you also define who is not in your part of your mission or who is the traitor to the mission. And Pernil just said, if you define community, you define it relative to what you're not also. And mm -hmm. so that's that uh, outer limit of the community. And some are more um, probably open and some more closed. But they, uh, to a certain extent, how much do you need to define yourself by the outer limits and how much you define yourself is something that's positively like your value or your mission or something mm -hmm. and i think communities differ in that uh and but but the idea as nor normatively i would say they all have some kind of like a century uh few uh, century petal kind of like a um uh, pool to be together to agree or something like that but the idea of the society as norm doesn't have that doesn't have that unit that doesn't have that center or one um, set of ideas that define it it could be different mm -hmm. yeah go ahead I'm, Cur I'm curious eugene whether like practical upshot for something like the circle school or other democratic schools that are using the term democratic would you like to see a democratic community school or a democratic society school or something like this? Like, what would you like? What would your, yeah, what would be the upshot of using this distinction? Um, like, because one thing I, I think of is in public schools, there's a constant tension against students forming into cliques. There's a recognition that students form cliques and I can see that as being like a way of understanding public schools as being like society. No, where... no it's actually reverse. Uh, fighting cliques, it's a very communal idea. It's not. No, society. I know, but that's, that's coming down from above. I, I'm just thinking about it this way because no, like no, no, most democratic because... schools no, no, that no. I know. No, no, it's not because it's above, because it's exactly want to have everybody together. Not as uh, not uh, separate, something separate okay. among us, which we respect, and we're not crossing the boundaries and live in the peace. Uh, one problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Your, I get that your idea is the, the normative ideal. So 
like mm -hmm. the, whether it's within the, the classroom community of a public school or whatever, uh, or the whole or the larger community. But one thing I'm noticing is, or thinking here is that there might also be an issue with scale. So uh, do you need, let's say the, the circle school or something, how many students are there? hundred, less than a hundred. Um, it's about 80 and students. So, and so there's this been this movement towards like emphasizing the value of micro schools because of their community communal kind of advantages. Um, would you like to see something like a democratic society school that aims to be scaled much larger, but using the same models of yeah, dialogical think, pedagogy within self-education? Yeah, it's a very interesting one uh, about this bigger or smaller uh, interesting. In my view, what circle school is exactly societal school. It's not by chance. And by the way, the more I, I talk with Jim about this, Jim Ritmudel, who is founder. Wait, you That's said it's a societal school? Do you mean like a community school? No, it's not community school, it's society. It, they, you know, they call themselves scaled down society. And it's exactly it. Like, for example, they very much resist to have any ideology, like, you know, about ecology, about uh, justice, about equality, about, I don't know, uh, vegetarian or not eating junk food, uh, leftist politics or or rightist politics, whatever. They really don't want to be, uh, they want to be neutral as much as possible and invite as diverse people as possible from that point of view. Uh, they very much blocks parents from participation. There is a firewall, like for example, they say we do not, uh, unlike many other democratic schools, we will never provide any uh, uh, advice how to do parenting, what good parenting is about. We say, we respect that. You do what you do at home, like for example, at home you might force your children to do homework or to study things or impose your curriculum. We do not criticize you, this is your realm. But of course, there is a uh, respect, expectation that you not uh, that family will not press on us. Like for example, if parents ask what their child doing in school, they say, "Sorry, you should talk to your child." Unless it's of course some kind of extreme things that happen, of course. But if it's not extreme, they think that the children have privacy, and uh, this is a way away from family, away from local communities, exactly because they say, we are scaled down society, we are not replicating, we are not continuation of family, we are not continuation of local communities, and we're not trying to build community. Uh, yeah, free from com communal, yes, and from socialization. By saying that, they say, we are not saying that everything, what, we are not fighting, we are not seeing, par like many, some other, there is, I, I saw some other democratic school, they really, how to say, uh, almost demonize parents because it's almost become a sect. The school become a sect their own. They're, you know, against authoritarian parenting, for example, against this and that, uh, you know, uh, uncritical things that the uh, family is doing and local communities as well. And uh, they absolutely not at all. They are not criticizing, that's everything is fine. Uh, because this is family, this is your values, but we are different. We're not about pushing any values in that sense, because I, although of course there is meta value of pluralism, for example, it's a meta value in a way, but it, why I call it meta value, but not the value, because uh, if you're really pluralistic, the, the test of pluralism is accepting non-pluralism. Uh, at least to some degree, to tolerate it to some degree that. And this is, it, its anti-value is also included. That's why it's what I call meta-value. It's not the value. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very interesting. We had this re uh, recent conversation and I'm learning from that conversation how much that school actually really uh, not by chance using this uh, scaled down society. In terms of the number of the people, that's very interesting to talk with them about that. Uh, uh, I definitely will ask them because they think that um, uh, one concern that I hear from them, the bigger school will lead to bureaucratization. And um, at, at least this is what they're afraid of. I'm not, I don't know if it's true or not. But one thing that I'm not considering 
in my paper, and I say it at the end, exactly what something you're talking about, is the role, you know, I, I consider community and um, society. One thing that I didn't consider is uh, institution. Mm. It's like taking from conventional normativity, because I think uh, institution should be also considered, by the way, in, in both settings, like when you normatively see as a community, still institution is there. And the question like, what the relationship between them happen? But when you have society, as you see society definitely based on the notion of the community, but it's also included in that institution. And the question is where and how, and I don't know this is, if somebody would like to do that, I will really appreciate that. Maybe Brian should do that because his dissertation is about uh, fighting institutions, institutionalism in education. And I think this is a very interesting topic. I also think that these, uh, yeah, as normative, uh, you can separate, uh, you can see what the ideal or nor norms are. But in reality, those are very fluid processes uh, that constantly cross each other because you start, let's say, uh, to some, some practice attracts a group of people like in Eugene's class. And just by working together, they start to create more and more kind of like uh, uh, communal relationships where before they may have been strangers to each other. And that can go to a certain degree and then fall apart or not fall apart it, and how it relates to. So as real processes, they are not so separated. And it's that, that's why it's very hard sometimes to say where things come from. And, why. and again, in my endeavor, it's for considered normativity of that, not necessarily real processes. Although real processes are there, that's why it's so interesting to include as a one real process is institutions. That's also a real process, and it's, it's there. And it's very much related to the notion of the scale up when it's becoming bigger. Uh, not necessarily scale up, but bigger, because how it, how it uh, feels, how it does, like uh, what's the tensions happened in that case. Yeah, but for them it's 80 people and they, they probably would love to increase it to 120, uh, 120 students, to have 120 students because for them it probably will be ideal, mm -hmm. uh, but not bigger than that. And it's interesting, why but, not? Uh, also interesting to think whether the uh, uh, larger numbers uh, or smaller numbers of the groups of people kind of like uh, promote certain types of values more than the other types of values. I, uh, I was recently in these two democratic schools in Israel, one of them in Hadera that has over 700 students and very different than the other one that has uh, in Jerusalem that has an, uh, under 100 students. I couldn't say that all the differences are because of the size uh, there is definitely differences in the ideology, although both are uh, democratic and have a lot in common, but the size in some way gives the feel of the life that's very different. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted Abram, you make a point about a grabber book about that. Uh, it's very interesting. This uh, they found this. They meaning actually uh, archaeologists, and uh, uh, they found that uh, big, actually very, very, very big cities that were uh, existing, uh, what they call mega cities, that existed during hunter gathering uh, society time. They were hunter gathering themselves. And nevertheless, they're constituting a uh, huge uh, mega, mega uh, cities, what they call, uh, which existed in where well, they found this in Ukraine. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, so uh, our view of kind of almost like a linear history and also history as uh, this is what Abram just wrote very nicely, that kind of predetermined by the like size defines something. It may be uh, maybe partially true, but maybe if it's true, it's only partially. Or maybe it's not true at all. And that's, Graber raised that question. You know, usually history, especially uh, remote history, uh, uh, presented very deterministically. Like, you know, just because they're hunters, there will be such and such things. Just because uh, what they hunt for, 
what the geographical uh, uh, conditions, what conditions of their environment, it will define social organization of them or social life or and values. And uh, they actually found that this is completely not true. It's, it's a myth, uh, but very consequential myth. So it's, it's very interesting. They, they argue that people constantly debating with each other how to live well. And that's important. And they make different decisions. And they may be very, in very proximity to each other and make completely different decisions, despite the conditions of their life more or less the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm also I'm trying to remember the number. Uh, isn't there? I'm trying to remember what it's called. There's a particular number that's meant to be like the extent to which um, it's one, one like it's 120 or something is the most Dunbar's number. Yeah, number. What is that? Dunbar's number. Dunbar. Yeah, it was originally yeah. Yeah, when he was studying monkey troops and then applied it to right. people. Exactly. Yeah, but by the way, it's very really common. Of that, the idea of Dunbar number. And so my, my point is that it seems that these like micro schools or the, you know, agile learning centers and Sudbury Valley schools, they tend towards kind of implicit buy into that idea of the Dunbar number that the value of having 120 or less, like don't go over 120, because we want all of the people in our school to know each other. But the idea is that beyond 120, they can't possibly have strong relations with all or know all of the other people. But it seems to me that your model of an like a normative ideal of a society would mean that you'd want the opposite. You'd want yeah. there to be strangers to encountering strangers, right? So and that's I, why I'm I think, wondering, like, wouldn't you want a kind of democratic school, like the circle school, let's say, to have like 500 kids? I, I think there's something important with Dunbar's number two is that this capacity to know the other also means that you understand them as a person, not an object, and your relations are regulated or mediated by that knowledge and personal understanding of each other as opposed to by rules where people become more objects that are the rules uh, and and, are and, and, and i argue brian that this is communal uh normatively communal uh reasoning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and by the way this idea that oh if you not know somebody you will treat that person as an object that's also communal Right. Because you don't know human, other human relations, valuable human relations, mm -hmm. uh, different from communal. If you're not communal, you're, it's like uh, I'm making this in my article, many uh, kind of interesting <laughs> cases, uh, linguistic cases, like uh, uh, in Slavic languages, people, like uh, name for the German people, literally what that means. It's people who couldn't talk. Right. <laughs> you know, or, uh, you know, this notion of uh, barbarians, uh, Greek mm -hmm. word barbarians, it's coming from burr, 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 mm -hmm. imitation of incomprehensible speech of everybody else. You see, how can you relate to them? They're not people even. Right. How can so you relate it? to Germans if they uh, cannot talk. That's and what on the other hand, of. Germans right. call themselves people who are clear to each other. Deutsch means clear, like clear, you can be clear. Uh, others are the... Right. So Abram's making me think of this idea, these democratic schools may be uh, underlying, it may be a, a community there, right? 120 and they cap it. And so they maybe they aren't quite reaching into society like we might like to think they are okay in this case i will say especially in education education is heavily corrupted by progressive progressive ideology progressive education ideology and that's and progressive ideology is very much for normative uh, uh, commu uh, community and i think it's continuation is uh, this uh, corruption and colonization because uh, it, it, this is another colonizing idea in my view. And this is my hypothesis again. I cannot say it for sure, but as of now, I think it is. It's like I was, uh, all my life was colonized by progressive idea, progressive education and so on and so forth. And it's so difficult to take it over. What's good about democratic education, because I think it's most incompatible with, with progressives, although not completely, I just review a book, 
that actually uh, was uh, like it's a hybrid between uh, democratic and progressive education with with nevertheless domination of progressivism so progressive education is very very strong and uh, and I think Brian, that's that concern is very nice. I, I like it. Thanks a lot mm -hmm. for making that. Um, so then, my <laughs> my concern here now is that, like, because of your critique of progressive education and wanting to get away from that, the traps of that leading away from the kind of conception of education that you have versus learning, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what my question was here. Something like, I'm just, I'm just not seeing the, the proper connect there, or it's not clear to me how those things connect up, back up oh, to yeah. the society community. I, I, I will give you, I'll give you, this is, thank you, thank you, because we didn't discuss that. And this is very important. Uh, uh, my other graduate student, here, unfortunately she's not here, I wish she were, Kathy von Duke. She, she did her dissertation on studying two democratic schools. One of these democratic schools was Jim uh, uh, School, which is the circle school. And one of the big things, uh, she, I, I still remember, she came to me very frustrated. And I said, Kathy, what's, what's happened? You know, I, she said, I'm coming to the school asking children, so what did you learn today? Uh, Tell me about your learning and this and that. And by the way, it was little kids, uh, seven, eight years old. And one of these girls, and I know that girl, she's so thoughtful. She uh, kind of hesitated for a while. And then she said, Kathy, why are you constantly asking us about learning? What we're doing here is not about that. Our school is not about that. And, you know, initially, it, I didn't know what she meant, but I thought she hits that girl. Something important. I told Kathy, Kathy, don't be frustrated. This is your finding. Write down. This, this is one thing they found. We don't know what it means exactly, but I think it's a gold mine. When they said that our school is not about learning. And I think uh, one of the birthmark of progressive education is defined that this about learning, like centrality of learning, first of all. And what's this learning is about? The second thing. They do two things. One, they say, we are here about learning. So everything else, we need to purify. Everything else is either preparation for learning or should be take out of this, uh, purify from that. This is not important. Anything else is not important or it's create condition for learning. But it's about centrality of learning. And yeah, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. About and second the things they start very sorry. Let me finish. And uh, second things they start defining what learning is about, which means usually they define what's good learning is about, uh, what's uh, legitimate learning is about, and these two things that going together in society. And this is why in normative society approach, these two things is about out. If you read uh, Jim's book, which is I recommend, he recently wrote a book about this. He said that. Uh, usually, progressive education interested in uh, pedagogy is organizing pedagogy. We are interested in organizing society, our life, not about pedagogy. And I think they're uh, hitting the whole thing is uh, mm -hmm. what it's about. That's so so important. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, well, I'm not gonna uh, say uh, that movie about sociocracy. If anybody watched in our movie club. In one place, one girl says, uh, you can choose whatever you want to learn, but the important thing is you have to choose something. To learn. <laughs> to yeah. learn, yes. Like that's, uh, you cannot say, I'm not going to learn anything. Every day you have to choose something to learn. Uh, that's one thing that I wanted to say. Another thing I wanted to say is in my uh, research on the uh, school, uh, democrat uh, democratic school that's uh, in Oslo in the 60s, they um, there emerged four different points of view about well, uh, among the students what their school should be about. And one very strong point of view was like the school should be about the uh, uh, education you have to learn something you have to uh, and and it could be said like they were saying school should be 
school, not a therapy session or not a, a music club or something like that. Well, there was another point of view, not so strong, but prominent there, is that why not? Should, shouldn't school be whatever people define it for? For somebody, it's very important therapeutic to be like therapy session. And for somebody, it's very important to be like a club. And some other people like only streaming. And so why not that? And other people like want to learn something. Good. Why not? <laughs> so, so there were th these two views that were very prominent, like kind of like a mon monistic and pluralistic. They were not defining there, but they were defining uh, at the beginning of that school what how this school should work. What should it be about? How how they can coexist together? Because they had very different views about what should, should school should be. You talk about Norwegian Norwegian uh, school, yes, in the in Oslo, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And they were 15, 16, 17 year old students. They discussed uh -huh. on their own this whole thing. And and of course, what's interesting is that uh there was interesting studies about uh alumni of democratic school. And if you look about that, many of them not talk about learning. What what about that? This is the place when I took, uh, like, I make decisions about my life. And, mm -hmm. Or I took in charge of my life, uh, things like that. And this is uh, very important. And again, if we uh, return back to original notion of school, or Greek notion of the school, um, which is, you know, the in Greek, the word school means leisure. So this, the the whole education is a form of uh, is a one form of leisure. But there are some other forms of leisure which is not uh, education, which is like play. It's another form of leisure. Hanging out with your friends. This is another form of leisure. Hobby, doing your hobby. That's another form of leisure. So this is the leisure. Hub. You know what? One interesting things uh, reading uh, Greeks. Uh, I spent some time in the uh, ancient Greece. Kind of fascination with these notions, and I was like, "Oh, school! Let me check what how school looked like in uh, ancient Greeks in Athens, for example." I'm not so much interested in Sparta or in some other places, but Athens was kind of my place. So, and I was shocked how oppressive it was for children. And by the way, that by it's very important who these children are. This is uh, was a voice of aristocracy, aristocracy, basically, because who can afford to go to have that? And it was basically, and what's interesting is when they described the schools uh, through the original Greek, uh, uh, Greek uh, sources, the description was it's kind of place for training. Place for training. And... So I was thinking, how come this notion, almost like philosophical notion of school, was different from the practices that children were involved? And it took me, uh, let me admit, this, it sounds like very stupid, but it took me two years to realize a very simple thing, that it was my biases around this. Because, of course, when I think school, I think about children, right? Then I again returned back to Aristotle and stuff like that. And suddenly I realized, of course, school was just the notion of school, the one that form of leisure, it was for three people. And of course, children, Greeks never saw children as three people. Like peasants were not three people from that point of view. Women were not three people. And uh, and they defined three people as ones who is, first of all, whose life is not defined by necessities or other people. Mostly not defined. Of course, necessity present, but it's not holistically shaped the, the life by necessity or by other people. And of course, neither children, children don't, do not fit to that. But so I, there is no school for children from so that point of view. This, in a sense, if your life is not defined by other people, you're not having a very strong community, actually. You, 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 you don't define your life by the community. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry I have to leave you all. It's very interesting, but... Thank you, Anna, for being that very helpful. Thank you. Okay, Thanks for your <laughs> contributions. <laughs> 
So that's very interesting, uh, that idea that, uh, and by the way, when people define their life, uh, uh, back to this alumni point, of course, you will define your education as a part of your life. So this is in school, this is the place where you define your life, and also you define uh, like your education and what constitutes an education in any particular moment. So what's education for, for that's the, usually in progressive education, of course, it's the questions that for educators, what's education is. And if it's about learning, what's good learning is about. But if it's a self-education, if it's this democratic place, it's that's exactly the question of the students, which they don't need to answer only by themselves. They can uh, ask it with the... Uh, together with some other students or with the particular, some particular people, they ask for advice and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Eugene, you said, um, you, I think you mentioned a book uh, written by an author where you said his first name was Vim or Jim. Uh, Jim Rickmodel. Uh, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, let me, of course, just a sec. Uh, who's that? Mm -hmm. Just a sec. Let me, uh, of course, my memory is uh, my N, N not, which for some strange reason I cannot open, but let me get around to this and open through the, okay, open and not. Uh, I just, I will put a reference, just a sec. Okay. Because oh, there is something wrong on my computer, definitely. Okay, will it? Okay. Yeah, this is... Uh, Jim uh -huh. uh -huh. But let me put uh, his book. Uh, uh, Abram, can you put his book? It's um, because my computer... Ah, okay, no, 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 no. It's just I have to wait. I have to find it in email. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let me open it. I haven't downloaded it. I'm actually okay. They want to update it, not now. They want to update it. Uh, uh, I found it. Uh -huh. Sick. It's very slow. My computer was slow because I guess it wants to restart it. Uh, it will not allow. Almost there. Yes. Now I can put it. Yeah, that's it. Wow, it's already three years ago that it published. I'm saying it's just recently, but it was before COVID, BC, before COVID. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, you keep going back to the Greeks, and <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just I'm just stuck on this idea of like, all right, democracy is in a a contested concept, right? And the democratic ideal, it seems that you're talking about democratic schools as having a community normative as the normative ideal of what democracy is. Is that right? Uh, let me, okay. Uh, several things. Uh, one thing, uh, when I say democratic, I mean uh, uh, there is democracy with capital D. Uh, because it is small D democracy. Capital D democracy is basically the idea that the life of the people defined by the people themselves. And when they have voice in defining their uh, life and, uh, you know, uh, that's capital D. In a way, that leads to the idea of self-education. Because if there is education, democratic education means self-education. Because you're defining, you are in charge of your own life, and education is part of your life, so you're defining your own education. Again, not necessarily by yourself, of course. Uh, if you want to make some decision by yourself, that's fine. Although they never like individualistic decisions, because even if you're not, if you're making decisions, you're still uh, on the shoulders of other people. That's it, it, it's unescapable. But you can. The, and there is small d democracy. It's when you're doing by majority of the war, by majority, and so on and so forth. That's small d democracy. And always, I, in our discussion, I talk about capital D democracy. Now, uh, my feeling is that majority of the schools, uh, democratic schools existing, 
they're heavily driven ideas by um, normative ideas by uh, community, but not only. And I think that in practice, many of, uh, some of them start pushing idea of society. I would say, uh, uh, and that's why democratic uh, schools are so interesting because in practice, many of them pushing notion of uh, society. Like for example, uh, Sudbury Valley School, if you look at this, what they like to talk about is the life of society, not the life of community. Uh, gym school, in my view, gym make a big step forward by introducing that scale down society and putting in not only by this term, but doing a lot of many other things. Like for example, it's very unusual things as uh, putting a firewall between parents and the school. It's not that parents completely not participate in this, but there is a firewall that they cannot cross. I don't think that firewall exists, in, for example, in Sudbury Valley School. I, it is it, it, it summer here, but for completely different idea, because uh, Neil thought that the community is an enemy. Uh, of the <laughs> of the good life uh, uh, in very in many ways. Uh, uh, that's a very different justification of that firewall that Summerhill had uh, than uh, Circle School has. Circle School do not see family as enemy, but they don't see school as a continuation of the family either. And uh, so, so this way, I would say Circle School for me is a very important. I'm so happy in my life just happened that I get together and we, by the way, we had a very societal relations. I have very societal relations with Jim. He's not, he, he will be saying, I mean, on his shoulder, uh, staying on his shoulder and he's staying on my shoulder. But in both cases, we're challenging each other. We're in societal relations with each other. Like, for example, I so much appreciate Jim, and initially I was very upset what he was saying. He was telling me, studying what I'm doing, he told me that I'm a benevolent dictator. I just recently wrote a paper about that. I, and of course, my first reaction was, no, I'm not. Like, I'm benevolent, but definitely not dictator. And uh, me, dictator, the last thing that I want to be dictator. And the more I uh, talk with him, the more investigated I came to conclusion, absolutely dictator. And even more, I cannot, in the, my conditions, there is no way I cannot not be a dictator. Just because I'm in the context where institution, like, uh, let me give example. I'm starting my class and say, well, you, you can be this or you can be that. And my students look with me and saying, uh-huh, uh-huh. At any time, he can do give it. First of all, what does it mean, what he's saying? I have freedom. Is it freedom to do what he wants to do or what I want to do? That's the first question. The second question, much deeper question, he can give me this freedom, but at any time he can give it away. Uh, and the fact that I can take it away is institutional. You know, I can do whatever I want. I can say whatever I want to say. And by the way, the students at some point might really believe me personally, but I'm still in the context of these institutions which make me dictator. Like they never choose me to, to be teacher, I'm assigned. The whole things, whole context created me as a, constructed me as a dictator. And I right. can choose to be benevolent, but I cannot choose to be a dictator or not dictator. This, this brings me back to, to the idea that parents are somehow shut out of the circle school because the parents are still the ones that are choosing to buy their kids into this school. I was just thinking about it first in terms of like, I have a child and I'm thinking about like where, I, what kind of school do I, would I want to put my kid into public schools? What kind of conception of democracy or what kind of, you know, what are my goals for my child? And I still have that. I am the benevolent dictator for my child. I still have legal responsibilities for making those decisions right? right um and so the parents yeah sure they may be they don't get to have a say what happens in the school but they pick the school probably with a view of having a normative ideal of community whether jim is talking about society or not they're thinking 
it's a small school. I've heard things, you know, there's this myth about, which you've addressed in your arguments about the idea that micro schools are somehow better because they, you know, they have better results or something overall. But when you actually look at the facts, they're just, it's a well, anomaly, yeah. right? Yeah. So it has nothing to do with the size of the school about their, their learning outcomes. Yeah. Um, but parents believe it. Generally, they think smaller school, there'd be more attention to my child and yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm wondering, does it matter if the, or to what, how much does it matter the way that the founders frame the school versus, which is they're benevolent dictators in that sense. They're saying, no, this is a community, this is a society. And they do shape things within that space. How much does that actually determine it as a society space? Uh, important things uh, in that particular school. By the way, it's fascinating. Uh, maybe uh, somebody should write a book about them. Oh, they wrote about themselves, by the way, but it's interesting. One part is interesting history, as far as I know. Uh, the school exists, uh, soon it will be 40 years. Uh, so it's almost 30 years, 30 something. But it started as progressive school. And it started as a parent school. So its parents started the school and it took them evolution uh, and transformation to figure out, first of all, they don't want to be progressive school and they want to be democratic school. Second, they don't want to be parent school. Uh, then you see, and it's a process in unfolding because they, by the way, they, they need to figure out that they were, don't want to be ideological school. We are not about uh, concerning about ecology or uh, for left values or for equality or for this, for that, for the, 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 the. it took them time as well. Like, for example, at some point it was, I, I, I think it was like, uh, we need to eat healthy food, for example, something like that. And they took them discussion and understanding that they, that's a very bad idea from that point of view, and they moved away from that. So it's interesting, and I think that's a work in progress, uh, Abram, I want to say, that them to realize, uh, like, for example, initially they want to be like, at some point, not initially, at some point they want to be a Sudbury Valley School, and then they realize, no, we don't want to be a Sudbury Valley School. So th that discussion, whom they want to be, is uh, unfolding. Yeah, and in many ways, they uh, kind of take uh, away from the colonization that they had, like, uh, many of them were progressive teachers or gravitating uh, to progressivism. I, I interviewed uh, one, it's actually a gym wife, and she started this, I think, uh, preschool, I'm looking uh, Pernil, at you, preschool teacher herself before that. And uh -huh. she was extremely progressive. She told me how she nicely she prepared the lessons. Very, by the way, nice lessons about uh, like uh, whales, about this, about that. By the way, when I've heard she provided such a wonderful activities uh, to do that. And I said, so what's the, like, sounds like beautiful. So what's, what's wrong? And she said, the wrong was uh, we're doing something, such an exciting thing. And in the middle of that, uh, I, a little boy might ask, are we done that? Can we go to play? <laughs> and I just, I said, that's such a bust that I was spending so much time on that. And look how the kids are engaged and why this? <laughs> and slowly she realized like, well, maybe this boy is correct. Maybe maybe that's, that's the problem. <laughs> And so it took them time, and I think they're still on that uh, on the journey. Like I think, at least I would say, I am on that journey as well for realizing things, and to and some of them come through the practice, uh, not from thinking, but from the practice. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, I, and I think that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's interesting, I was thinking about uh, maybe this type of school uh, as a society, it's maybe uh, should be kind of almost like conglomerate of the schools, that the several schools come together, and maybe something like that. Uh, like, the same, that I was thinking about that mega city, that mega city come from tribes coming together and finding synergy. 
uh, of being together and uh, uh, enjoying uh, and living in peace and actually and having problems with each other, of course. So maybe that should be the model. It's a uh, school is a, a conglomerate of the schools or some kind of unity of the schools. Some by unity I mean loose unity. Of, I was thinking about how, like, predominance of, like, uh, societies of, like, the philosophy, PES, philosophy of education society, societies, and, uh -huh. I mean, ERA, the Alternative Education Resource Organization, has a kind of community-minded uh, normative ideal that everyone doing alternative education is this community whereas i i'm wondering if yeah maybe one way to get to this um this vision that you're suggesting there of like a con mega city of micro of micro schools or democratic schools or something is to just frame the meta organization that engages with it, each other is to be a society rather than a normative i, I don't know uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We, where the idea is that uh, uh, there is no necessary commitment to the common goals and uh, common values and things like that. It's very interesting. Um, it's very interesting. Yeah. Give me a lot to think about. Jamie. I really liked this presentation. This section. Symposium set up. It's really good. Yeah, thank you. And uh, extremely helpful. I'm just immediately after that. I'm so glad that it's recorded because uh, so I will not forget things about uh, like what other people said and will uh, edit my paper. And it was, uh, thanks a lot. And uh, I will definitely include that in acknowledgement. Remember? <laughs> That's, uh... yeah, but, <clears throat> and thank you for including and I promise that I'll be a bit more prepared and read a bit about the things that all of you seem to know a lot about which I do not know much about the cycle school and cycle school and so on but I'll try to catch up with you so maybe be a bit pre more prepared until next time and Pernil for you I just want to say that we have different things that running like we have movie club when we discuss uh, educational movie in 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 general things it's not about uh, although we called club initially schooling around world and time uh it's uh, schooling in this case should be understood not traditional schooling like any kind of ideas education so we watch and discuss it it's uh we're doing every other friday again if you email me if you're interested in that we have also educationalist club when we discuss our research and teaching, uh, we, uh, we have uh, also um, in other things we have a book club. Uh, when we just, which is not only book, it could be article as well. Article and book club, we should call it, uh, where we discussing uh, readings. So that's we meeting once a week. Uh, it is in any of this. Uh, no, I'm sorry, once a week, uh, once a month. Well, oh, good. <laughs> Goodness gracious! I thought I would have no time to work, but uh, but that's good. Once a month is good. Once no, I'd be very month happy month. to join you. Yeah, and Pernilla, we have a very different approach. We have uh, in terms of book club, we have this. Uh, we started always traditionally with this traditional question: Are you a good student or becoming a good student? A good mm -hmm. student who is uh, read the whole book or whatever text and becoming who did partial or he didn't read at all or uh, just knows who is the author or what's the title. And we welcome everybody and uh, you should not feel bad because if you don't read a book, it's also great because you will uh, participate in a way because you ask a very important question like what's the book is about. And it's so important because, uh, you know, when everybody re read the book, it's kind of very artificial to ask what the book is about because people think they know. But if you start listening to each other, you start to realize, wow, 
One person thinks that the book is about this, and another person about But people who don't read the book ask a very good questions. Uh, exactly well, thank because you. it's well, thank you. easier to explicate things that otherwise will be assumed that we are on the same page, but we are not. So yeah. it's like in anything else. You don't need to be prepared. Don't apologize. That's... No, but I'd be happy to join you because I think that this is the right place to to qualify my thoughts about uh, consulting schools and children in trouble. Yeah. And uh, another uh, uh, announcement, of, this is maybe for Abram, I don't know if you're interested in that or not. There is whole uh, cooperative, it's called cooperative, uh, uh, by, about studying research about democratic schooling or democratic education, better to say. Okay. It run, run by Peter Gray. And I don't Peter know, Gray. Peter Gray, yes. And okay. uh, it also happens once a month. And okay. uh, uh, Peter Gray, yeah. If somebody wants to participate, but it's about research. It's not about uh, kind of organization of education, or it's not about uh, how, whatever. It's not practical issues, but how to study it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again. Wait, cool. What's that group? Peter Gray's running. It's called uh, just A. I forgot what's A staying for. Oh, just a second. Let me get uh, on the uh, Facebook yeah. and. Uh, and I'll tell you. Uh, okay. Peter Gray, A S T. Alliance of the Alliance of Self. Okay. What is directed the, education? What the A stand for? Alliance. L A. Okay, Alliance for Self-Directed Education. Yes, 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 yes. I always and forget so what A. What what A stand for? Yeah. So they're Say it's an alliance. What's an alliance versus a society, right? <laughs> my, what's my what's the that, ideal there of an alliance? Yeah, yeah. By the way, I think he means society in my yeah, that's, I think uh, so approach. Too. That he also yeah. It's uh, thanks for pointing for that. It's not community, uh, but alliance means loose, a very loose kind of uh, uh, set of the people, right? It's loose. Well, Apply. Doesn't have to be a loose. All right. So, way back in this talk, when you, you got me thinking about Plato, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, I was thinking, um, I was kind of working on a paper thinking about the um, concept of Xenia, of the ritualized friendship that it was kind of predominant in like Homeric Greek society prior to the polis. And so, the idea is that um, guest friendship, I don't know if everyone here is familiar with this idea of guest friendship is the one of the English translations of Xenia. But Xenia is where we get the word for stranger, uh, like xenophobia or xenophilia, ah. love of stranger, love of... And uh, the idea is that how do we make, how do we make non-kin kin alliances? Like, so there was this whole ritualized process that existed in Greek society where you could submit yourself and say to like an enemy and say that I, you could do these particular things and say, you can kill me or you can, we could become uh, allies. And there's like a famous example of like Odysseus, like thinking he's going to destroy the Egyptians or whatever, and then submits himself, becomes a kind of slave. And then, but then they develop this guest. But when he's met by that, like he basically he realizes he's going to get killed and he gives himself up. All of his other men get killed, and then he is then treated as a king, though, because the alliance is only between equals. And then, uh, anyway, so the whole idea was in, in Homeric society, it was all this kind of nobles, noble king like uh, figures that would develop relations with each other, and they would be stronger than blood. And so, to the point where there was all these other conventions, like um, you would name not just you're, you have your children, you don't just name your kids after a famous grandfather, but it's even more powerful if you name yourself after a famous uh, person that you're related to through, and you would also inherit these Xenia relations, right? So you could name yourself after someone, and this is how 
I can't remember who the figure is, but there's a famous, uh, wait, it's Alcibiades, you know, in Alcibiades and Socrates, right? Alcibiades, that name actually comes from the Spartans, but he has no biological relation to the Spartans. It's all through guest friendship. And this is part of, so the whole, the big project of Plato is how to deal with this pre-existing institution that transcended cities and city alliances with the growing kind of move towards uh, majoritarian polis kind of not only just like the politics of polis or whatever, <laughs> but also like the entire way that war was being waged, it was totally shifting because under Homeric society, you just got small bands of people and it all, anyway, the point is that everything was changing in, in Plato's time and he had to find a way to kind of marry the noble with the democratic rising impulses. And, you know, the whole idea of phalanx is a democratic way of fighting wars. Everyone come together as a unit, right? Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so there is like the whole idea of the love of wisdom that comes out of that out of his project is a way of kind of marrying these two things. So it got me thinking about the question of the stranger that's supposedly inherent in cities. I, I don't think it is. Actually, the, the problem was to bring the stranger back into the city and to find a way to like hold space for the stranger. No, within no, uh, no, no, no. The, uh, let me tell you that the, there is a difference. I see the big difference. You know, you're talking about that stranger what you're talking about, the stranger as a friendly stranger, uh, what Zenos. But the Zenos was possible, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's possible among communities or tribes. The other tribe become Zenos to me, and people from that tribe become Zenos to me. What city allowed to have strangers that not attached anymore with the, from the, with the communities? They're strangers, and they don't need to be even representative of other community. You don't even need to know that community. That community never have even heard about that. And now that person can live there entire life and not to be back to that and not create this even link anymore. You can link, live there as you are without any community behind you in the city. And I think this is a new possibility that city created. I, I know. I, I'm sorry, I don't think I agree. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've heard this this story, and I, I've I bought this story for a long time. But I'm thinking more and more that all right. So one of the tensions in ancient Athens, because I think that you know your foundation story there is Athens, right? So part of the problem is that like um, Pericles introduces these marriage laws because there was too many people. Anyone who was married to a Greek would become a citizen and would have voting rights. And so women were able to marry non-Athenians non and then they would, you know, non-Athenian nobles coming back and then they'd have voting power. And this was a problem. And so they introduced a marriage law of both that then your children would not be citizens. Mm -hmm. And so there was this tension. It wasn't it, like you could have money in the city of Athens, but you would have no longer voting or citizenship rights, no opportunities to like participate in the courts or anything like that. Right. And so, and that was prior to Plato, right? That's, that's a major shift that was undergoing the, like the tension of, well, if it's just becomes majoritarian, if everyone becomes a citizen, we need to limit who is a citizen. And it doesn't seem like, a, like, I know that there's the idea of let's go down to the Piraeus and let, this is where all the migrants are moving in and stuff like that. Right. But, it doesn't actually say like that's the ideal that we have that comes no, no. out of Ab Abram. You forgot that what I said. Remember, I said that I'm more interested in Rome in this sense. Not oh, I didn't hear that at all. Athens, <laughs> because Rome had yeah. exactly uh, open citizenship, unlike unlike. And this is again, some historians say yeah. that military uh, Rome. Uh, that's why Rome so rapidly from point of view of the historic time back then it's absolutely explosion that happens with rome rapidly and it's become such a big military power suddenly out of blue because of their open citizenship unlike uh athens what was athens, the open citizenship you join the army and then you become a citizen uh rome it's much more that you spend uh, time in rome and you become roman uh, just open. That's one thing. Another thing, uh, uh, slavery was 
uh, temporary in, in Rome, unlike uh, in Greek society. In Greek society, if you, in Greek uh, policies, if you uh, slave, you will be slave, and your children will be slaves. No, uh, Romans, I forgot, it depends on the year, uh, between 10 and 20 years maximum. You can mm. be for, and after that, you're not slave. Any, and, and not only you're not slave, you're Roman. You're fully Roman citizen. So that's why the, it's become so open. And mm. that's why it becomes such a gravitational side for many things is because it's easy to become incorporated and use it as a, uh, that synergy and source of power for so many groups, diverse groups. So that's uh, at least one, some historians think uh, why Rome was so unique in this and, and why uh, unlike many other including uh this uh, greek societies and uh, uh, and so and so forth so for me when i talk about city i'm very easily switch from <laughs> athens to rome so athens yeah to i think rome, you should be clear athens, on that i, I like what you're saying here about rome, rome. You should rome. rome make the distinction very, in your arguments yes better and, and also with this uh, interesting idea of uh, democra democracy versus republic that's very also inter interesting if you uh, I mean in this case when I say democracy with the small d not with capital D uh, although it's related to this kind of things nice. uh, another thought that I was having uh, this is a, an ongoing thought I've been having about like these schools like agile learning centers and the circle school and whatnot so and it relates to your concept of the community behind which is clear to me now than it was before this conversation this idea that um the school has a mission and especially because the the school or like the benevolent dictators have set up the school they're like true believers themselves in the mission of the school and the kids come to kind of take on that like we are gonna we're gonna be we're creating the school of the future right that's generally or we're creating a unique special kind of whatever person you know you're part of the privileged group um i think that and the idea that adds more to the student's voice and their uh sense of empowered agency and whatever than anything else that seems to me to be like an essential ingredient and part of the problem is, is like um you know it, it shows to me what the completely different impact of say a public school a public school just seems like not only is community in the lower d low democrat lower d democratic sense of community control or something but it's like the ideals of equality that everyone should be equal and then the question of um what's the term i was gonna say sandbagging but like you know making not only bringing everybody up to a level but sort of like making sure that everyone sort of comes down so that everyone's equal in the sense of equal uh not just equal opportunity but equal access to resources and all this sort of thing like you got to make sure that you close achievement gaps and things like that these are problems of uh, a public school system whereas i don't know it's just that when when i first started working in the like like volunteering in agile learning centers i mm -hmm. did find that i would come back into this pull back into the kind of progressive education trap of thinking yeah but i'm really interested in are the kids learning like i kept asking that myself i thinking back on that now while you're giving this talk is like yeah yeah i was always like yeah yeah well i believe it's a better learning experience but you know we don't have the evidence or something to prove that they're learning more or that they're actually more empowered or something but sorry i'm not getting to a point here <laughs> One comment that I want uh, to again, uh, which is I think terrific, uh, this point, first point that I'm just saying was made by, for me, uh, uh, Sidorkin, uh, because he, uh, Alexander Sidorkin, he wrote that uh, part of the success of progressive education, he said, and success defined by the, uh, not necessarily learning outcomes, but uh, 
Yeah. And by the way, the book that I mean, uh, what I'm referring, thank you. Let me provide the reference to that book. It's education without relation. Uh, uh, yeah, something about learning relations, I think, because he wrote quite a few yeah. books. Uh -huh. This is the book that I'm talking about. So he said that kind of success, I hope it's there because may, now I'm thinking maybe it's in another book. Uh, uh, he said the success of uh, progressive education very much related to the opposition to the conventional education. They basically said uh, to the students, you have to cooperate with us or else, or else you will go to conventional education. But uh, another thing that I think is very interesting, it's that book by David Graber, who talks about uh, schismogenesis, uh, which is uh, Gregory Bateson term. Do you remember that, Abram, in that book he talks about? Which is- uh, Yeah, that's it. That's in the history of everything. Yeah. Schismogenesis. And uh, let me, I'm just thinking how to spell that. And I hope that Abram, you will yeah, uh, put it in there. You correct me. Uh, I already put it in the chat. Ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's a, that's a relief. The schisma genesis. It's basically uh, uh, what can be called this, or I will call oppositional uh, identity. You define yourself, you don't like something or somebody. So everything that another person is doing, you're doing opposite. <laughs> Whether or not you like it or not yourself, by the way. You might not like it, but if you just hate that person, really deeply hate, you start doing completely uh, opposite things. And you define yourself in, as an opposition. So if conventional school is doing homework, you will not do homework and so on and so forth. Uh, by the way, uh, just by the way, really, uh, in uh, the tragic things is a war between Ukraine and Russia. I can see that schismogenesis going on, on like uh, on steroids, I would say, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. And by the way, in both ways, like it becomes like completely, everything become opposite. And some people actually very much against that and warning, especially in Ukraine, that it's very dangerous development, the schismogenesis. And we should be careful. Uh, alternative to uh, schismogenesis, which is also discussed in the uh, book by Graber, is just to think about way, like uh, thinking about good way of life, living, which is Greek kind of thing. To think about like what's good way of thinking. And in this case, you make decision not because you're in oppos opposition to something, but because you uh, like and dislike something and start thinking about why you like and dislike something rather than you just, because your enemy is doing that, you're doing opposite things. Or because your enemy don't do that, you don't do that. Uh, or you, you start doing that. Uh, it's kind of much better way than schismogenesis. But schismogenesis are not, a, it's a real thing, it exists. And uh, like I'm visiting sometimes schools uh, democratic schools or alternative schools and ask kids. I like to talk with the kids and ask kids like, oh, tell me about it. And in some places it's completely schismogenesis. They immediately start talking about uh, in opposition to the traditional school. And this is not what I'm like, I just in general think like, what's going on here? Like, what you like here, what you don't like here. And, but the kids are very much socialized in that discourse. That's probably what Abram you're referring to. Uh, in, uh, I'll let me tell you that when I went to uh, uh, the circle school, uh, it's happened, but much less than in many other places. It's interesting too. I, I, I never thought about that until we were just right now, that it's much less, so. I was actually thinking about it because I'm working for this company right now. It's called Synthesis mm -hmm. and it's, um, it's this virtual schooling environment where the kids play video games that are designed by this company, Synthesis, and mm -hmm. they engage in like critical thinking and collaborative thinking in relation to playing the games. And that's what they're pitching the parents is that, you know, this is an extracurricular, the kids come online and they learn how to become super collaborators and whatever. But I think the success of it, so much of like, their attention because it's it's really a question of how committed they are to like doing solving things together and engaging in the games because some of the kids 
they're just like, oh, I'm here to play games. And other kids are like, you know, you ask them why they're here and they repeat the, the story that they've inherited from the parents, which is, you know, like Elon Musk was involved in, uh, he sent his kids to this school and we're creating a school, that's the future of education. And we're learning how to become um, like problem solvers together. And that's what we're focused on. And they, they buy that story. And then they pursue that mission actively with their time in the sessions. Those students who have that story, the other students that are not do, like able to repeat something like that mission, they just, they are like, oh yeah, we're playing games. Right. And so my, my sense is that having the mission statement is doing all of the work. Like the kids buy into it, they believe it. There is a maybe I don't know. I don't think that's an example of Schisma's Genesis, but it is an example of like it is this mission that sort of that they can buy into and believe. And I saw that also with agile learning centers. Like there are some kids who they get there and they're like, I don't know. Like I was, you know, my parents put me in here, and I, I'm not really sure. Like you know, maybe the kids are suffering for various reasons, like a death in the family or something like that. They were really suffering in conventional schooling and they need to just have like time out whatever and maybe and the parents may, may be hoping the kids will find their agency and whatever whereas there's usually a core group of kids who the founders or whatever that of these micro schools um kind of attract and those parents are committed to the mission right even if they agree to like not ask the kids to like what did you learn today and whatever the parents are committed to the mission the kids repeat the mission in the school they say yeah this is why we're here and i'm free to do whatever i want and i really wanted to pursue these things you know, the kid didn't come up with this themselves it's the community behind them right the pair of the parents but also the parents being a part of this community forming this thing and it's because they have that that they actually achieve mastery in anything at all like it's got nothing to do in my view it has more to do with that than anything to do with like the kids are free to choose and not choose like no it's they they also have a belief that they are free to choose and not choose and they're being driven by this narrative that they've internalized well part of this not only internalized because i talked with the kids and they told me because i was puzzled like why do they even need to talk about that like if i ask you like why you're at home bizarre like why you're at home that's what do you mean people will say right but they told me the kids told me that very often they in contact with the kids who are not coming to this their particular innovative school and when they start telling about like for example we don't have homework we don't have classes we don't have like this is the response to the other it's weird because it's not normal so they need to develop uh, uh, there is several strategies one strategy is stop talking about that and never mention that again some students do that. They don't know. They do, just they, they prefer not to talk about that. They never tell about that they're going to different type of school. Like you don't need to talk about school, your school anyway. Um, but some other kids pick up this ideology and the discourse of uh, schisma genesis, and they still emphasize your school is about this, our school about that. And we are in our school, from my point of view, cool in your school is boring. And that's become everything become like that. Like you are forced to do things and we are doing only what we like to do, which is not always the case, of course. But I think one of the consequences here is that like, you know, all the people who work in these spaces, they have to be true believers, right? If you are self-doubting and like keeping open the possibility well i don't know if it's better or not you know like you're killing the one thing that is working <laughs> i in my view yeah, yeah. This, this is in <laughs> you can't be dialogical as a benevolent dictator you need to like be committed to the mission yeah but in some other schools this is very interesting uh, uh there are schools and i know i saw them i read first about that and i was like this is bizarre and then I visited and I said, wow, this is, I, I'm seeing what I've read about. So in some schools, there is moratorium among it, uh, adults to discuss anything about like philosophy or whatever, because they might disagree and disagreement is not, you see this community issue, disagreement is not acceptable. We want to keep this, the peace is more important. 
you know, the friendship is more important than ideas. So please, ideas are out. So uh, I remember in, the, in Baltimore, we visited school uh, with my Russian colleague from Russia. Uh, I showed, and uh, he said it was so boring for him to be there, except talking with the kids. The kids were uh, absolutely fascinating what they tell us, but adults were just, uh, uh, when you ask a question, uh, they basically say, this is what we're doing. And they say, why? This is what we're doing. Uh, because they're, uh, almost, and I, I don't know, is it because we ask in public space of them or whatever? And they told us, uh, we, there is a moratorium here on any discussion. And there was actually uh, two young uh, interns who wanted to learn how to be uh, in, uh, like uh, staff in democratic school. And they say, think, uh, they say, we're dying here because we want to discuss things. Like, like you, we're so thankful you for asking questions. Um, like, why is this? Why is that? This is so much we're missing of that uh, because it's absolutely forbidden. It, it, and it's formally forbidden. It's not just in practice forbidden. It's just like, it's almost like there's no sign of that, but it's in the air. Uh, forbidden to discuss any philosophical issues of the education or, uh, or about the school. I like that because, I mean, my experience has been that it's informally forbidden. And this is a feature of community, like of uh, community as the normative ideal, community as agreement. And the problem with that um, for learning and for inquiry, like if, you, if you're a school, if you want kids to be pursuing knowledge, you want them to be engaging in disagreements and like not, and questioning the truth of things, right? I mean, that's, that's my starting point for, you know, sort of like when I was involved in Agile Learning Centers, I started getting involved in uh, community of philosophical inquiry with philosophy with children. And I was doing philosophy with children in the Agile Learning Centers. And I thought that, that was a good way of organizing even like the interactions between the parents and how they were going to run or, or like what things they could run for the community. And I got shut down a bunch of times by people who had basically accumulated power in a way that where power is hidden. Like, so in these community things, it's like, oh, we all agree, right? And someone has power and it's hidden. And the benevolent dictators are sitting there behind, you know, behind the screen, pulling the, pulling the strings of what's actually permissible and not. And, you know, they, they build agreement with each other on the side. They build alliances and all this stuff, but we can't talk about power in this sort of thing because then we're, or analyze power in these environments for the same reason, because then you lead, you break the community, you, you're you gonna create a disagreement and a challenge, and we can't have that. We just need to X, Y, or Z, like, oh, we just need to, like, we can't show too much disagreement among the staff or with the parents, because then you'll scare parents off, and then we'll, we won't have enough funding, and then, but, you know, we, we could fall apart at any second, so we gotta give a united front. There's always this sort of, rationale for it not doing it but anyway i it's interesting because i that there could be formally this agreement is a good idea all right yeah i'm sorry <laughs> i didn't want to interrupt you no, 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 no. this is an issue i think yeah, you, you're very um uh taken with it sort of it's uh, it's important and um I'd like to discuss that more another time, but I gotta go for, get some dinner now. So, sure, sure. Uh, what time is it there? What? What time is it where you are? You're in Copenhagen. Uh, a bit south. I'm in my garden house, uh, a bit south of Copenhagen. It's eight o'clock in the evening. Oh wow! Sorry. <laughs> well, what time is it at your place? Two. Two p.m. Oh Two yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but um, thank you, and uh, we'll meet again, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Nice to meet you. Right. Yeah, we've been on this call three hours now, right? So <laughs> probably we should probably just end it to make sure that somebody might ever watch it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's their problem, right? So they can skip, they can stop. Yeah, play it at three 
times the speed or whatever four times the speed. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, while they're sleeping. Right. <laughs> we should end on a cliffhanger so there's a sequel, right? Oh, yeah. That's a good cliffhanger. Oh, I wanted to show you this this book, by the way, EJ, because I know that if you're reading Graber, then maybe you'd be interested in this book. This is the Marilyn Strathairn book. Write, uh, yeah. this, I, Marilyn Strathairn Relations. That mm -hmm. was, I kind of started to... I couldn't remember her name, and all I could remember uh, was the title of the book, Relations, <laughs> which didn't... And it got it really hard to, but it, one of the core findings, she's an anthropologist, British anthropologist, and yeah. And so it's an anthropological account because relations in English means both the epistemic relations of things, but also means kinship. And kinship is like foundational for anthropology. Um, and what, they, what she finds is that actually the term in English for relation, um, meaning both the epistemic relation and the familial kinship tie emerges at the same time in English in the, at the as the emerge like 16th century, 16th, 17th century, it starts to emerge. And it's a consequence of shifting things happening, like um, shifting modes of like who could inherit mm. uh, money and all that sort of, sort of stuff. But that it, but anyway, so there's something interesting happening with the positive. So, like, if you are a, rel a relation of mine, then you have uh, the ability to make claims on my property. Mm. Right? You could show up at my house and say, hey, I'm a relation. Like, oh, okay, I'm a distant cousin. Yeah, I'm a relative. So you have to house me. All right? There's all these sorts of obligations. And that was really affected things. And so they, uh, anyway, this is just, like, one of the early chapters. But the, the point is that, there's an interesting tie between the positive conception of a relation, like someone who has the right to, like I have a relationship, I have claim over you, and the epistemic conception of a relation as a positive thing. So that other things become invisible, like stranger relation, the relation of no relation becomes harder to see and in how it shapes, let's say the relation of kin. You could say forgot who you're making kin with, but there's the there's always the existing the non-relative. <laughs> anyway. uh, yeah. So it's called uh, the relation issues. It's called relations and uh, anthropological no. account. Because, because I found a completely different. It's by her, but it's interesting. Uh, it's called a relation and uh, issues in uh, complexity and scale. Hmm. And she wrote a book prior to this one that was pretty big. It's called The Gender of the Gift. Yeah, I can see the gender of the, uh -huh. in, uh, in uh, Melanesia, right? Yeah, Melanesia. she's a Melanesian anthropologist. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, she scales up from her field work up to like very deep philosophical puzzle. Like this book is all like what I was talking about then about relation it's to do with even the conceptions of um, positive knowledge in science, uh, what could be proven empirically and whatever, like through Locke's definitions, his definition of a relation starts with examples of, anyway, examples of familial relations positive relation right so the two things mutually build on each other to create this thing and she gives a good account of how that sort of leads us to think in particular ways that we we can't think outside so when we're thinking of the community we're thinking of i don't know i feel like there's some connection here mm -hmm. some relation between what we've been talking about and the concept of a relation that's underlying and it makes me want to go back and re rehash this a little bit. Um, especially because uh, when I came to dialogic pedagogy, I was like, and was reading Sidorkin, uh, the term they were using for this kind of work was relational pedagogy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the relations, like the, the norm was not only that we are a community, but that we ought to do work, care, care work on 
recognizing how we're co-formed by each other and always in a positive sense, mm -hmm. right? Like to be dialogical is to be, uh, you know, always speaking through others' mouths or something or... <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, there is some the mouth of, there. Uh, like the usually quote Bakhtin about like our words is half ours, half somebody else, something like that. Yeah. It's more about uh, what can be called dialogue agreement rather than something else. Hmm. It's about like collaboration. It's almost like synonymous dialogue, collaboration. And uh, like harmony. Yeah. And uh, this yeah, is like community is also the same thing, right? It's... Yeah. And especially that strange, uh, like even reading Bakhtin when he reads completely, and it's not about that at all. It's like a very nasty thing that's happened sometimes. <laughs> especially in his book on Dostoevsky, but many other things as well. He's not that type of uh, happy, happy, joy, joy kind of thing. Right, right, right. Yeah. P part of that, again, uh, my feeling is, again, even reading uh, Bakhtin, that this Western world is so much about alienation and, uh, and opposition to alienation is community. Uh, the, the humans are too much naked uh, and uh, I need to take this point just say okay I mean, you take another call Brian what, what work are you doing right now I mean I know you're a teacher but you're still working on your dissertation are you muted all right yeah I am uh, though I have a sabbatical this coming year so um, from the teaching work yeah, well, sort of. I'll be teaching a course at University of Delaware each semester. Um, but before this meeting, Eugene said something was up with that on the university's end, so I don't know what's happening. So, <laughs> um, yeah. But, um, yeah, I'm looking at, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on two hours of sleep right now, too. So, I'm a little sorry to hear that. Um, the, uh, um, I'm looking at uh, teaching professionalism in the context of an institution and how institutionalization I'm trying to formalize things is um, problematic and, and essentially um, deprofessionalizes people, um, reduces them to technicians. Um, and there's also the same uh -huh. relations there and um, you know, decontextualized decision making. This kind of thing. That's interesting. So, what's the conception of profession? there that is distinct from the technician professor? Well, there, there's some of them that are very technician oriented, like the professional, here's best practices, and, and it's very much defined by an administrator or some theoretician outside of the practice. Um, but then there's others, the definitions of profession that are very much about discretion and context of the practice. And mm -hmm. I think it's the tension between these two definitions that's most interesting to me. Um, last night I was reading um, uh, a court decision um, regarding the, the Pennhurst Hospital in Pennsylvania, um, which was a hospital for children um, that was um, in the process of closing because of horrible treatment of people there um, and throughout the 70s. And I think the decision was in the very early 80s, but it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, in that, they articulate um, a lot about the, the um, professional discretion about what's right and what's good and, and um, how that there is a certain context which is considered acceptable within that, but it's very much um, shaped by the professionals that are involved in the practice. So a profess professional is someone who still has the ability to speak up and, you know, use free full and free frank speech or whatever so you can criticize whatever right they're not, in an, or, or... they're not in an agentic state to uh, outside theoreticians they're they're often an agent to their clients um for teachers that would be acting as an agent for their students 
um, a fiduciary agent. And so they understand what's happening there in context of their engagement of the practice with that student. It's very much a contextual-based wisdom. And, um, and it's that discretion and decisions that are made in that, that space that um, should be respected. Unless, as the Supreme Court ruling is kind of pointing out, there can be decisions that are made so far out of the realm of some kind of norm of what happens in that um, uh, among professionals. Um, like you may say, well, you know, my student wants to be abused, therefore I'm abusing them. And um, I think that would be outside of the norm of the profession so far that, um, you know, people would say, it, it, it's nicely worded in the Supreme Court case about what's happening there, but something like that would be outside of this, this norm of professional judgment, good professional judgment. Mm -hmm. So it's not that a profession has absolute freedom to say, well, this is... I'm a professional, therefore I think this. I, I would define that uh, like like that uh, from listening to your conversation. Uh, first of all, it's authorial judgment based on phrenesis yeah. recognized, recognized by the society. And when you say recognized by the society, of course, that includes what you're just talking about is uh, putting the boundaries or, uh, of that. Right. Of, the, uh, of the authorial uh, authorial judgment and phrenesis. The yeah. big picture, yeah, big picture mm -hmm. of uh, project here is, of course, we want to. I've heard this story a few times about you know, teachers aren't treated as professionals. How do we get teachers to be treated as professionals? What? How do you see that project? Like, is your project in line with seeing like okay the institutions are interfering with the professional or the profession of teaching and what are the consequences is that roughly the area you're looking at there yeah i mean that that uh how do we get teachers to be viewed as professionals may be a little bit beyond what i'm looking at but it's not a stretch um certainly i'm identifying some of the problem and the institutionalization is often welcomed by a lot of teachers. They welcome this kind of deprofessionalization to occur. Um, and acting as a mm. professional, it's stressful. It can create a lot of anxiety because you're now responsible for decisions where um, if something is institutionalized, you just need to carry out what a protocol is. Mm. So there is some resistance to professionalization that's happening among teachers, but certainly among administrators and politically this desire to control education, control schools, um, you know, whether it's, you know, standards and accountability or, you know, the, the Florida's, um, I forget the name of the bill, but the don't say gay bill. Um, you know, a lot of these things are intrusions into the, the dangerous discretion of teachers, right? This discretion of teachers is, is viewed as dangerous. So there's a desire to control that. And also in the politics of a school district, where you have a school board that's elected by the local community people, how do we keep the teachers from engaging in something that uh, it may not necessarily be offensive in the context, so it could be, um, but certainly a lot of things could be interpreted as being offensive, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that, that becomes dangerous because um, local politics can sometimes be pretty extreme or radical radical reactions to things very personal so yours is more of a descriptive account of teachers as not treated as normative i mean not treated as professionals or rather than say uh kind of look at assuming the norm that they should be professionals well i think some of those ideas are explored but i, I think that maybe a better way to describe what i'm doing is really um accounting for my own experiences in this and seeing the different tensions between these different definitions of professionalism and also um, how that's occurring in the context of an institution and how the intrusion of the institution into these professional spaces does in fact interfere with um, acting as a professional in the, in the ways that I would like to define professionalism as opposed to you know, this more technician kind of definition. Gotcha. Yeah. It's intriguing to think through those problems. Mm. Yeah. Well, it, it's, this whole thing has just been therapy for my experience as a teacher and administrator. So, uh, <laughs> I fortunately have very good administration. It's right now that um, 
um, Eugene is is somewhat disappointed because they're less inspiring to me. But um, less yeah. inspiring because they're less. No, no, it's, it's not provided. Right. Prohibitive. Right. <laughs> <Data>. right. <laughs> not providing data for dissertation. That's right. Not, right. <laughs> they're too nice. <laughs> yeah, they are. They're, they are far too nice, <laughs> and then, and it, but it's also offering an interesting contrast in in terms of now we have administrators that are very much trying to develop this sense of professionalism. They're not solving every problem. They're not intervening. They're not trying to standardize practices between teachers, mm -hmm. um, and teachers are left in a position where sometimes they're like, well, I'm used to being told what to do, and now can't you just tell me what to do, right? 